okay so i hope uh, the class has been started yes 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 yeah so finally the class has been started so welcome to the amazing platform of physics wala once again venkat hi madan hi how are you orchid jeeva aruta abhinay everybody so welcome welcome to this amazing platform where i wait just a second i am okay somdeep hi how are you hello 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 everyone good morning madan good morning to all of you very very good morning mohit a very good morning to you too yeah yeah such a drag what a name yeah hi to you all very very good morning to all my dear students go and call thank you anirudh thank you isha hi ujwal welcome back ujwal how are you i hope you all are doing fine vineet 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 how are you okay so good morning everyone okay 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 so go and call everybody so before we properly start our today's class just go call your friends today session is going to be really very important as you can see that today's session is all about botany brahmastra ayan good morning okay so hi sudipta a very very good morning to all the session is going to be very very important for those student who are preparing to score 180 on 180 if you all have seen my last uh live in that we have discussed the number of questions but in that day i found one thing that many students are having doubts confusion in some very very important topics so today once again i am back with all those topics so today the main motive of today's botany brahmastra class is to discuss all the important topics their concepts which are going to be really very important for you for your day after tomorrow examination good morning good morning gautam good morning everyone shraddha varman welcome back how long this session will be orchid see let me tell you the session will be quick will be crisp and will be bilkul up to the mark we are only going to discuss some important concepts like for example if i talk about chapter morphology there i am going to teach you fahi fahira very very good morning wiki good morning i hope you are not wiki kaushal because uh, today in the morning post i have seen that wiki kaushal along with katrina kaif they both are off to maldives and they are going to celebrate the birthday over there i hope you are not that wiki and uh, yeah <laughs> okay so who else honey yeah 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 honey i'm just going to start okay please don't worry rajesh good morning okay chalo so i will not waste your time as you all are very very interested in considering and studying the topics now as i have told you today's session is mainly all about what today's session is mainly all about talking about those topics which are very very important for your sunday examination we are not going to revise everything but yes we are going to revise all those topics which are those which are which you usually forget right some important tips i am going to give you some important tricks i am going to give you some important concepts i am going to discuss and these concepts i have planned for today so that they remain fresh in your mind and you quickly respond to your exams if those questions come on sunday paper so yes good morning ya yeah, ananya yes yes all the best okay fine so let's start with the first chapter in living world beta in living world there are some important things from where it is seen that in last 10 years questions are asked from that paper hello ayush welcome back ayush how are you so the most important section of living world chapter where students usually face trouble is in the taxonomic categories where scientific name comes and second is taxonomical aid especially if i talk about key even i remember that day uh some students were asking me to explain key again and again 
so yes today we are going to do in this chapter living world the taxonomic categories as well as taxonomical aid specifically key chalo so without wasting time let's start with taxonomic categories now my dear students in taxonomic categories you know there are seven obligate categories those seven obligate categories are from lower to higher species genus family order class phylum or division depending upon we are talking about plant kingdom or animal kingdom and then followed by the topmost category that is kingdom utkarsh we will do genetics also yes virain today's session is all about theory important concepts only and yes i will do genetics as well you need not to worry pedigree usually students face trouble with pedigree questions so need not to worry even pedigree questions also we are going to cover today okay i'll tell you that how to solve pedigree questions in the most easiest manner okay chalo so let's start directly first beta this chart i am going to draw for plant kingdom i'm going to tell you the easiest method to learn examples in different categories when it comes to plant kingdom first of all chalo navin don't worry about hours please don't worry about hours jitna time bhi lagega let it be today we are only here for discussion for learning some important tips so that you can score 180 on 180 without wasting time let's check out first species in which plant kingdom we are going to consider are first is solanum i think i should use some different color pen oh, oh which color should i use yeah i think blue will work yeah solanum tuberosum apart from solanum tuberosum the another species in the genera solanum is solanum nigrum third is solanum nigrum then solanum esculentum these are the species which you have to remember neat will ask questions related to it apart from solanum the next important species which you should know is ipomia batata that is commonly called as sweet potato ipomia batata commonly called as sweet potato next is mangifera indica you know it is mango right and then last which you should know is triticum astivum that is your wheat correct now what are we going to do ma'am pen color oh 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 sorry sorry it is not visible i think black is going to function yeah fine fine so sorry guys yes 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 i understood i did not check it uh yeah i'll use black okay so now all these three first species which i have written that is solanum tuberosum nigrum and esculentum there are three different species but they come under gen genera solenum right ipomia belongs to genus ipomia batata sweet potato belongs to genus that is ipomia mangifera indica species belongs to genus mangifera right now triticum astivum belongs to genus triticum now my dear students apart from genus solanum there are more genus like for example petunia and thatura there are three different genera which on the basis of their similar vegetative and reproductive features they are belonging to the same family solanaceae so ipomia along with petunia and dhatura 
the three different genera which on the basis of their similar vegetative and reproductive features they belong to the same family solanaceae right ipomia belongs to family what yes these columns are not visible uh to okay see now they will be visible i'll write little bit bigger and then they will be visible to you all need not to worry okay so ipomia belongs to family convolvulaceae there are two different families mangifera remember students it belongs to family anacardiaceae and triticum belongs to which family who is going to answer me okay so who is going to answer triticum belongs to which family poaceae correct now as you see that solanaceae and convolvulaceae manoj is saying ma'am please write on black screen okay okay guys guys only for this chart only for this chart i am going to write within this otherwise everything will be written on your black sheet so just manage with this simple chart listen to me and try to remember okay okay now you have two different families that is solanaceae and convolvulaceae these two different families on the basis of their similar floral features they belong okay fine so these two different families on the basis of their similar floral features they belong to the order polymoniales students you have to remember all these terminologies in your day after tomorrow exams question can come from this section thank you ayush polymoniales moving ahead anacardiaceae it belongs to order sapindales and poaceae family belongs to order poales correct similarly polymoniales and sapindales they are two different order but they belong to the same class that is what these two different order they belong to the same class that is dicotyledony on the basis of their presence of two cotyledons in their seed they are dicots whereas poales they belong to class monocotyledony why because in their seeds only one cotyledon is found now dicot and monocot they are two different classes but both belong to the same division angiospermy and this belongs to the kingdom planty so students in this chart you have seen what you have seen that see species so different different species but all the species they have joined together to the same kingdom that is planty so it is said that you as you go higher in the series from species to kingdom the similarity among organisms decreases so the most similar organisms they belong to same species and two highly dissimilar organisms they are kept together under the same category of kingdom so you can see so many different species but as you keep on moving ahead their categories become common 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 and at the topmost category kingdom all different species all different genus families they come together as one plant kingdom correct so please will you learn this chart yes will you all learn this chart this is for plant kingdom if yes then i'll move ahead similarly i'll draw a chart for animal kingdom as well correct okay so moving ahead with the next chart again sorry yaar this is also a chart only but after this chart everything will be written on the black sheet only okay first thing if i'm going to draw this chart for animal kingdom then the first change that i have to make is cut this division and write phylum 
do you all know why why have i done this change i have done this change because in case of animal kingdom instead of division we use the term phylum so this i am going to talk about animal kingdom so let's write the species first that you have to learn for your ncert for your neat examination under animal kingdom okay 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 yes oh jetha lal you remember me now okay so species first species that we are going to talk about is felis domestica or not even felis domestica the first species that i am going to talk about is panthera panthera leo panthera tigris panthera pardus panthera leo is lion panthera tigris is tiger and third species which you have to learn under the name panthera is panthera pardus okay moving ahead panthera pardus next species which you have to remember is felis domestica which which organism is felis domestica it is cat felis domestica is your cat moving ahead next canis familiaris canis familiaris my dear students this i am talking about dog canis familiaris is the scientific name of dog moving ahead homo sapiens you know who are homo sapiens it's we humans and one more example you have to remember given in your ncert that is musca domestica that is commonly known as house fly right chalo now let's try to fill this chart so three different species but they all belong to the same genus that is panthera correct felis domestica belongs to genus felis canis familiaris belongs to genus canis homo sapiens belongs to genus homo right and musca domestica belongs to genus musca right yes or no now my dear students panthera as well as felis they are two different genus but they belong to the same family felidae that is why we say then cat and lion these two people cat and lion they are like i don't know you know this or not cat is called as mossy of lion right there's a whole story between cat and lion that cat is actually called as the mossy of lion why because they belong to the same family that is canidae belongs to the same fa family sorry felidae felidae right similarly canis dog belongs to the family canidae homo sapiens we belong to family homo nidi musca domestica belongs to family musidi right yes or no now moving ahead felidi and canidi they are two different uh, families but all the members of two different families they are carnivorous they feed on flesh so because of that they belong to the same order that is carnivora right homonidi we belong to the order primata along with monkeys and apes our order is primata musidi musidi belongs to order diptera beta ye yaad rakhna hai you all have to remember this stuff please students do remember this stuff question will be asked from this section 
this chart is very very important if you remember them then you will be able to solve questions why am i doing this why am i doing the theory because now it's a high time that you just pick up the important lines and important segments from ncrt so that you can do them properly in your neat examination correct okay very good vicky so moving ahead now you can see that carnivora and primata they are two different orders but you can see they all have mammary glands they can feed their young ones so they belong to the same class mammalia right whereas diptera diptera belongs to class insecta because they have three pairs of jointed legs so they belong to class insecta correct mammalia along with other classes like aves reptiles and amphibia they belong to the same phylum chordata mammalia belongs to which phylum it belongs to chordata phylum why because we all are chordates whereas these musca domestica if i talk about then insecta insecta order or in fact insecta sorry class it belongs to the phylum arthropoda they are non chordates so they belong to arthropoda and two different phylums they ultimately belong to the same kingdom animalia very good anaima yes 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 okay very good everyone now this is how the chart of animal kingdom has to be questions may come in between that tell the class of homo sapiens tell the phylum of musca domestica like this question may come if you remember these two chart for plant kingdom and animal kingdom then you will be able to solve those questions and surely you will get all your marks correct very good royal now so these are the two charts which you have to remember coming to the next important segment of your living world chapter is taxonomical aids in taxonomical aids you know about herbarium museum everything but usually where students find trouble is with key where students find trouble key so today i am going to discuss about key so that all your doubts related to key gets over students for your neat examination just remember four terms four statements for key only question from key if it is going to be asked it is only going to be asked from these four lines will you all remember the first line very good anima very good key are analytical in nature the thing first line which you have to remember for key is analytical in nature very good orchid second key is also a taxonomical aid where we are using them to identify of an uh, identification of different species on the basis of their similarity and dissimilarity this is the second important line so key is used in the identification of species both plants or animals on the basis of similarity and dissimilarity of organisms similarity and dissimilarity of organisms so this is a second important line no shri these are not for quick referral system this term you use for herbarium herbarium is used for quick referral system key are only analytical in nature third statement which you have to remember for key is that in key each statement or each pair of contrasting character out of which one you select another you reject is known as couplet so what is couplet couplet represents a pair of contrasting traits of which one you select and another you reject on the basis of your specimen 
ओके उज्ज्वल यस वेरी गुड श्री एंड इन ईच कपलेट देर आर टू स्टेटमेंट टू कंट्रास्टिंग स्टेटमेंट एंड ईच स्टेटमेंट ऑफ द कपलेट इज नोन एज लीड सो वॉट यू आर गोइंग टू राइट ईच स्टेटमेंट ऑफ द कपलेट इज नोन एज लीड स्टूडेंट्स If you attend this class seriously, let me tell you one thing: you are surely going to score very good in botany. Today, actually, I am disclosing the paper. If you attend this session seriously and you listen to each and everything and remain active in the class in throughout the session, then surely you will score very, very good in your exam. So today's session is all about decoding tomorrow's exam paper. ओके चलो सो आई होप ऑल द फोर स्टेटमेंट्स रिलेटेड टू की इज क्लियर वेरी गुड आयुष व्हाट इज लीड व्हाट इज कपलेट ऑल दीज फोर स्टेटमेंट्स नाउ दिस मच इज इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर योर लिविंग वर्ल्ड मूविंग अहेड विद द नेक्स्ट चैप्टर दैट इज बायोलॉजिकल क्लासिफिकेशन इन बायोलॉजिकल क्लासिफिकेशन सम चार्ट्स आर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल द विटिकस फाइव किंगडम क्लासिफिकेशन If I talk about Whittaker's Five Kingdom classification, the chart which is given in your NCERT is very very important. Usually questions are asked from this chart, so you have to pay attention. Chalo. Now the five kingdoms according to Whittaker's classification are Monera, Protista, Fungi, Plantae, and Animalia. this whitaker fellow he actually discovered kingdom fungi on the basis of yes yes ayush you can say i don't have any issue ayush you can say ma'am is leaking the paper today yes ma'am is leaking the paper you may spread this information whatever i am teaching you today is really very important that is why i have i am taking this session today just two days prior to exam this is the only reason that why i am taking this session no issues ayush spread this news let more students join the session let everybody get selected at least in botany chalo okay what is this valimai did i don't know explosion army and uh, vegetation what are you talking about i really don't know chalo coming back so these are five kingdom classification proposed by r h whitaker in the year 1969 on the basis of mode of nutrition specifically many features he considered but the most important was mode of nutrition on the basis of which r h whitaker separated fungi from kingdom plantae yes breaking news very good royal chalo so first we are going to select the features on the basis of which we have we are going to differentiate or we are going to classify the five kingdoms those features are cell type cell wall presence or absence of nuclear membrane body organization and mode of nutrition ujjwal spam is going to happen today okay first on the basis of cell type if i talk about prokaryotes then only kingdom monera is made up of those organisms whose cell type is prokaryotic rest all organisms from protista till animalia they all are made up of cells eukaryotic in nature so eukaryote 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 okay now yes nega now next cell wall if i talk about cell wall then cell wall is found in majority of the organisms but their composition is variable for if i talk about monera then they have cell wall bacteria have cell wall but their cell wall is made up of peptidoglycan also known as murin cell wall also known as murin made up of sugar and amino acid okay come on next protista cell wall may be present like in diatoms then it may be made up of cellulose along with cellulose some other chemical may also be found fungi fungi cell wall is present but it is made up of chitin correct next plantae 
In case of planty, cell wall is purely cellulosic along with cellulose, hemicellulose, pectin, etc. Okay, now Shrijan, welcome to the class, Shrijan. Shrijan, test tube reactions are neither living nor non living, they are simply called as living reactions. Okay, chalo. Animalia, cell wall is completely absent in them. So, right absent over here. Third feature of classification by R.H. Whittaker. Presence or absence of nuclear membrane. If I talk about kingdom Monera, then their body cell is prokaryotic. And in prokaryotes, true nucleus, presence of nuclear membrane is absent. Their genetic material is diffused in the cytoplasm itself. So, absent. Otherwise, in every other organism's nuclear membrane is present they all have true nucleus right next on the basis of body organization so except kingdom monera and protista their body is made up of only one cell thank you bharat thank you so their body is made up of only one cell hence their body organization is going to be cellular oh my brother is here Abhi Agarwal, hi Abhi. So he's my brother. I don't know from which <laughs> from which family, but yes, Abhi Agarwal. He, ex he said that he's my brother. Okay. So body organization for Kingdom Monera and Kingdom Protista is cellular. Moving ahead, planty. Sorry, fungi. If I first talk about, then in fungi, body is made up of number of cells. Hi ma'am, what is your good name? Gaurav is asking my name. Please somebody message my name. Please, come on. Gaurav is asking my name and uh, please tell him my name. Chalo. Okay, coming to fungi. Fungi, the body is made up of number of cells. They are usually multicellular except yeast. And their different cells, they join together to form tissue. But their tissues are... Loose tissue, parenchyma is loose tissue body organization. So in fungi, you have to remember they are multicellular, but their body organization is loose tissue type called mycelium. Planty, planty in plants, their tissue body grid, tissue organization is present and tissues they join together to form organs like roots, stems and leaf. So they have tissues as well as organ grade of body organization then coming to animalia in animalia even tissue grade of body organization is there organ grade organ system i am a complete organ system body organization representer because in my body respiratory system digestive system all is present so in animals tissue organ organ grade everything is present i hope it is clear now moving ahead with the next and the most important parameter on the basis of which R.H. Whittaker classified his five kingdom classification that is five kingdom classification on the basis of mode of nutrition. Right? So he found that in kingdom Monera, if I talk about kingdom Monera, then kingdom Monerans they show maximum diversity in terms of nutrition they are autotrophic as well as heterotrophic in autotrophic they can absorb or uh, they can uh, prepare their own food either using light as a source of energy or chemical as a source of energy and if they are heterotroph then they can be either decomposer parasite saprophyte etc okay so you can say that monerans they show maximum diversity when it comes to mode of nutrition after this is protista in protistia in the protistians they also they also show great range of diversity when it comes to mode of nutrition but not as much as monera so in protistians also some may be autotrophic some may be heterotrophic fungi purely heterotrophic planty purely autotrophic animals purely heterotrophic i hope this chart is clear to each and every one uh, okay gaurav so you know everything about me that is very good but still you were asking my name so 
इट्स डाउटफुल ओके चलो सो आई होप दिस फाइव किंगडम चार्ट इज क्लियर नाउ मूविंग अहेड विद द नेक्स्ट आयुष आयुष हार्ट ओके चलो नेक्स्ट इज किंगडम फंजाई क्लासिफिकेशन थैंक यू थैंक यू मुथू नाउ नेक्स्ट चार्ट विच आई एम गोइंग टू टीच यू इन बायोलॉजिकल क्लासिफिकेशन टूडे इज your kingdom fungi classification chart this is also very 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 important this five this uh, kingdom fungi classification chart again questions will be asked from this chart in your neat 2022 so if you really want to score good then please pay attention on my chart okay so how many classification and how many groups kingdom fungi is divided it is divided into five groups Oomycetes, zygomycetes, ascomycetes, basidiomycetes, and deuteromycetes. These are the five groups in which kingdom fungi is divided on the basis of their mycelium nature, on the basis of uh, fructification, and on the basis of sporulation. Now let's discuss this chart in detail. Okay, chalo, let's start then. first feature on the basis of which we are going to study this classification of kingdom fungi is their habit and habitat where are they mainly found then except oomycetes all other are terrestrial in nature so they are aquatic the most primitive fungi group oomycetes they are found in water but remaining all other groups of fungi they are terrestrial in nature okay moving ahead second nature of cell wall what cell wall is made up of you know that fungi cell wall is made up of chitin in case of fungi cell wall is made up of chitin but if i talk about the most primitive group of fungi oomycetes then their cell wall is not chitinous rather still it is cellulosic they have cellulosic cell wall and remaining other groups of fungi they have chitinous cell wall chitinous is what is chitin chemically chitin is a polymer of sugar nag n acetyl glucosamine okay so third feature body structure mycelium how is their mycelium how does their mycelium looks like so in case of lower fungi if i talk about that is oomycetes and zygomycetes together called as phycomycetes then they have aseptate hyphae unbranched hyphae so you can write in these two they have aseptate unbranched and cenocytic means multinucleate hyphae cenocytic right but if i talk about my remaining higher fungi that is asco basidio and deuteromycetes then they have better mycelium better hyphae which are septate branched maybe either uninucleate or binucleate so in all these three case the hyphae or mycelium is septate and branched uninucleate or binucleate clear yes or no very good ayush very good gorav ah uh, okay gorav okay i got it okay so hi subhadra yes very good subhadra okay very good praveen very good everybody is answering ha ah, bilkul royal okay yes yes i'll be taking that also lokeshwari not to worry that will be also taken yes yes okay so mycelium ho gaya now next important feature is the type of spores produced so first we are going to talk about their mitospores the asexual spores produced by different groups of fungi 
if i talk about oomycetes then they reproduce by producing they reproduce asexually by ma'am protistian cell wall is made up of which component shrijan it is usually cellulosic but apart from cellulose like in diatoms they may also have silica deposition okay chalo now asexual spores in oomycetes are zoospores the motile planospore in case of zygomycetes they reproduces asexually by producing sporangiospores right ascomycetes reproduces asexually by producing cunidia bachcho ye sawal this question now the thing which i am the line which i am going to say next is in your neat paper so please pay attention basidiomycetes they do not reproduce asexually rather they prefer vegetative reproduction by fragmentation okay remember this line no asexual reproduction rather shows fragmentation right yes or no direct line from ncrt in question paper need 2022 chalo deutromycetes cunidia deutromycetes they are more similar to ascomycetes okay deutromycetes they are more similar to ascomycetes next point after asexual spore next point of classification is on the basis of their other names what these group of fungi can also be called as so oomycetes they are also known as algal fungi as they are found in water and their cell wall is cellulosic so they are also known as algal fungi zygomycetes they show plasmogamy with the help of conjugation method they show con they uh, they show conjugational type of plasmogamy hence they are also known as conjugation fungi please students remember these additional names as well as yeah so yes yes aruta thank you pranay thank you so much yes very good jacob moving ahead ascomycetes they are also known as sac fungi because they reproduce sexually they under uh, in a sac like structure called ascus the zygote is produced which undergoes meiosis to produce haploid ascospores that is done within a sac like structure called asci hence ascomycetes they are also known as sac fungi basidiomycetes known as club fungi because they reproduce sexually on a club shaped structure called basidium deutromycetes bachcho in members of deutromycetes yet what is not found the uh, sexual reproduction is yet not reported in deutromycetes hence deutromycetes they are known as fungi imperfectae okay now apart from this my dear students examples please learn from your ncrt examples i will say only right now it's a high time somebody asked me for penicillium so student penicillium is actually your ascomycetes such examples many examples are given for example right now only focus on ncrt no need to go here and there if in neat examination a uh, question on the basis of examples will be asked that those examples will be directly taken from your ncrt book so please pay attention on them yes okay pranit not bracket fungi my dear it is fungi imperfectae deutromycetes chalo yeah thank you thank you chalo moving ahead so these two were important things the classification of kingdom fungi and classification by rh whitaker these two are the most important thing for neat 2022 so please do them properly moving ahead with the third chapter that is plant kingdom and first and foremost thing which you are going to discuss in plant kingdom is 
algae and their main division scientist frisch who is also known as father of phycology father of algology divided algae into some groups mainly chlorophyce phyophyce and rhodophyce this chart is so very important once again for your neat 2022 and that is why i am teaching this chart again over here i have taken this chart directly from your ncert and the only reason is because i want you to score good please please everybody listen to me this chart is very very important chalo shuru karte hain let's start so as i told you scientist frisch divided algae into many groups the three of which we are going to study over here green algae chlorophyce brown algae phyophyce red algae rhodophyce now why these colors because of their appearance right so the most important feature on the basis of which the classification of algae is done is on the basis of their pigments common name i have told you green brown red next is major pigment this is the most important feature on the basis of which classification is done ujjwal yes very good major pigments found in green algae are chlorophyll a and b so due to the presence of these pigments chlorophyll chlorophyce appears to be green in color if i talk about phyophyce brown algae then they have chlorophyll a as well as they have chlorophyll c and apart from this they have a special xanthophyll called fucoxanthin this fucoxanthin is brown in color the more amount of fucoxanthin the more brown coloration is of phyophyce okay chalo very good coming to red algaes red algaes my dear students they have chlorophyll a apart from chlorophyll a they have chlorophyll d and the red coloration is due to the presence of phycoerythrin thank you ujjwal they have phycoerythrin which is imparting red color to them so red algae are red due to phycoerythrin brown algae are brown due to phycoxanthin and green algae are green due to the presence of chlorophyll a and chlorophyll b okay moving ahead stored food now they are for they are photosynthesizing they are preparing their food so if excess food is there then they store food chlorophyce stores food in the form of starch phyophyce stores food in the form of mannitol and laminaria please oh thank you praneet i am a goat i am a bakri okay so phyophyce mannitol and laminaria rhodophyce stores food in the form of floridian starch which is structurally similar to amylopectin and glycogen presence of cell wall surely cell wall is there now what that cell wall is made up of first of all if i talk about chlorophyce cell wall is cellulosic as well as rich in pectin so along with cellulose cell wall also have pectin now coming to brown algae brown algae cell wall is also having cellulose and pectin but apart from that they also have non sulfated water holding substances called hydrocolloids like algin question neat 22 paper likh lo write it somewhere in the paper that ma'am is saying question will come on algin this year question is there so algin is what it is a non sulfated hydrocolloid water holding substance found in brown algae okay chalo moving ahead in case of red algae the cell wall is cellulosic having pectin apart from this they also have sulfated algin is non sulfated but in case of red algae apart from cellulose and pectin they have some sulfated hydrocolloids like agar agar or 
Cara Genin. Correct? Moving ahead. Number of flagellas on their gametes and on their asexual spores. First, in case of uh, chlorophyces, chlorophyces, then they are motile. They usually they produce gametes which are motile in nature. They may. Ayush gelidium is an example of red algae. Chalo. So, in case of chlorophyce, if I talk about, then chlorophyce, they have 2 to 8 equal sized flagella, isocont flagella, 2 to 8 apical like this. 2 to 8 equal isocont apical flagella on their spores as well as on their gametes. Yes, sir. I would like to answer one student or I have, I have just read one message. Whosoever is asking that ma'am is this session going to help us for our NEET examination beta? Yes, that is why I am standing over here now. I am shouting, I am speaking, I am speaking continuously. Why? Because this session is really going to help you. I am only revising those topics which are important for this year NEET examination right chalo okay coming to your pheophyce brown algae then they produce flagella number is two but they are unequal in length heteroconti and rather than apical they are lateral sidewise like this two flagella but of unequal length yes okay coming back to your uh, Rhodophyces, in Rhodophyce, bacho, motility is totally absent. Not even their gametes, not even their spores, asexual or sexual spores. Nobody produce flagella. Flagellation, motility is completely absent in Rhodophyce. Important. Mark this. Important. Now, last feature on the basis of which we are going to classify our three groups is on the basis of their habitat, where they are found. So, all are aquatic all the three algae are aquatic if i talk about chlorophyce they are richly found in which fresh water they are more merely found in fresh water if i talk about brown algae they are aquatic but they are mainly marine like they may be found in salt water some forms may be fresh water but majorly they are marine and same way is for rhodophyce they are aquatic but majorly they are salty they are found in salty water okay some forms may be even fresh water but majorly if i talk about they are marine i hope this chart is clear yes arpit kya lag raha hai aapko what arpit is feeling Achha, oh you are feeling like that Achha, okay so arpit i how to help you i don't know how to help you chalo bhai okay moving ahead next is in plant kingdom apart from algae if i see the entire plant kingdom uh shrijan is saying great people come from great thinking ayushi ma'am is one such example oh my god thank you shrijan for your kind words now moving ahead i hope algae classification is clear to everybody now next group in plant kingdom are bryo terido gymno angio now students time is limited so i wanted to teach you each group independently but since i cannot do so i'm going to make a comparative chart where i'm going to teach you all the groups in comparison and this is going to make understanding easy and better also okay chalo so here you can see the chart on the screen so on the basis of features which i am going to consider for classification number one is their body organization body organization okay now these organisms these group of plant kingdom my dear students they are arranged on the basis of the evolution sequence the most primitive group of plant kingdom are algae followed by bryophyta then pteridophyta then gymnosperms and the most advanced groups are angiosperms so you have seen that i have arranged all the groups of plant kingdom in a sequence of evolution and the first feature which i am going to consider for for your uh, 
understanding is body organization in body organization if i talk about bryophytes then the main body is represented by group of haploid cells called gametophyte thallus like body hoti hai in case of bryophytes the body organization the main body is represented by group of haploid cells thallus like body gametophytic body so in case of gamete of bryophyte gametophytic phase is dominant phase dominant and body is main body is thallus like right now coming to pteridophytes slightly evolution has taken place pteridophytes are better than bryophytes then what you see that the main body in case of pteridophytes changes from haploid to diploid now pteridophytes from pteridophyte onwards the main body will be represented by group of diploid cells that is sporophytic such a body is known as true body so in pteridophyte you will write that the main body is sporophytic that means true body organization in case of pteridophyte true body organization is found gymnosperms again same same in gymnosperms as well as in angiosperms the main body is represented by group of diploid cells that is sporophytic body okay now next feature on the basis of which we are going to classify them is their life cycle pattern if we talk about bryophytes then their life cycle pattern is what haplodiplontic algae life cycle pattern is haplontic but if i talk about bryophytes then their life cycle pattern is haplodiplontic haplodiplontic means main phase is haploid gametophytic that alternates with slightly reduced or parasitic sporophyte so their life cycle pattern in bryophyte is haplodiplontic haplodiplontic means what main phase is haploid which alternates with reduced sporophyte that is diplontic phase coming to pteridophytes pteridophytes in terms of evolution they are better than bryophytes so their life cycle pattern changes from haplodiplontic to diplohaplontic very good sharon very good yes so pteridophytes the life cycle pattern becomes diplohaplontic why because in case of pteridophytes the main phase is diploid that alternates with slightly reduced gametophyte so main phase is diploid so first we are going to write diploid that alternates with haploid phase that is gametophyte hence the life cycle pattern in pteridophyte is diplohaplontic okay ncrt bachcho for pteridophytes also writes haplodiplontic that is also okay you can call the term haplodiplontic also for pteridophytes but it would be good and it will make your understanding easy if you say that the life cycle pattern of pteridophytes is diplohaplontic rather than haplodiplontic otherwise it's okay moving ahead with gymnosperms and angiosperms the highly dominant phase become diploid which alternates with a highly reduced gametophyte or haploid phase hence the life cycle pattern in the topmost two groups of plant kingdom becomes diplontic that means sporophyte is highly highly dominant over gametophyte okay third point spores types of spores produced after meiosis after sexual reproduction beta bryophytes they are purely homospory they produce only one type of spore after meiosis all the spores produced are of same size 
in case of bryophytes hence bryophytes they show homospory right they are pure homosporous if i talk about if i talk about pteridophytes then some groups of pteridophytes like dryopteris they are they are homosporous if i talk about another pteridophytes like selaginella then they are heterosporous they produce two types of spores on meiosis some big sized called megaspore and some small sized called microspore so in pteridophytes both homospory and heterospory is found yes vedan correct okay so in case of pteridophytes homo plus hetero both the type of spory is observed okay ayush pratham lokeshwari lokeshwari no <laughs> okay so in pteridophytes both homo and heterospory is observed but if i talk about gymnosperms and angiosperms then they are purely heterosporous after meiosis two sized two sized spores are produced some big sized called megaspore and some small sized called microspore microspore develops into male gametophyte whereas megaspore develops into female gametophyte so they are pure gymnosperms and angiosperms they are purely heterosporous correct yes very good vedan gymnoto angio only heterosporous now next feature on the basis of which you are going to classify is their female and male gametophyte you have male and female sex organ rather i should use the term sex organ the next feature on the basis of which we are going to classify them is sex organ male as well as female in case of bryophyte bachcho मैम मैं कहाँ से हूँ श्रीजन आस्किंग मैं आई बिलोंग टू विच स्टेट सो बेसिकली आई एम फ्रॉम हरियाणा यू कैन से नाउ सो आई बिलोंग टू हरियाणा बट या आई एम लिविंग इन साउथ फॉर टाइम बींग चलो सो कम बैक टू सेक्स ऑर्गन्स ऑफ ब्रायोफाइट्स इफ आई टॉक अबाउट सेक्स ऑर्गन इन ब्रायोफाइट दैन द फीमेल सेक्स ऑर्गन इज नोन एज आर्चीगोनिया which is responsible for producing female gamete and male sex organ is known as antheridium that is responsible for producing motile male gamete very good sharon very good so the female sex organ in bryophyte is archegonia and the male sex organ in bryophyte is known as antheridium okay coming to pteridophytes in pteridophytes also the same terminology is is used however in pteridophytes archegonia slightly get reduced so most developed archegonia is in bryophyte and as you go high in the series the archegonia starts getting reduced so in pteridophytes also female sex organ responsible for producing female gamete is archegonia and male sex organ is known as antheridium which is responsible for producing motile male gametes okay chalo gymnosperms mein again same term female sex organ highly reduced archegonia now onwards beta from gymno on, gymnosperm onwards male sex organ are not called as antheridium rather we start using the term pollen grains which are released and dispersed with the help of air current they are pollinated with the help of air current angiosperms the female sex organ is now no more called as archegonia now rather we start using the term embryo sac correct we start using the term embryo sac and male sex organ carrying the male gamete is known as pollen grain okay 
नेक्स्ट फीचर ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ विच वी आर गोइंग टू क्लासिफाई देम इज मोड ऑफ फर्टिलाइजेशन मोड ऑफ फर्ट सी बेटा कैन यू रियलाइज वन थिंग दैट विद द हेल्प ऑफ अ चार्ट वी आर एक्चुअली डिस्कसिंग ऑल द इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग्स कैन यू फील दिस और नॉट दैट मैम इज टीचिंग all the difficult topics in a very simplified manner with the help of a simple chart students if you are having your pen and notebook now then please write everything in your in your notebook please try to copy these points because they are just like quick dose of revision even if you are standing outside your uh, examination center and trying to enter inside then if you if you have your quick notes in your hand you'll just quickly revise and things will be done question will be this is whole plant kingdom chapter whole plant kingdom chapter just in one page can you even ever imagine this thing everybody is facing trouble with this chapter but here i am doing this for you i'm bringing the whole big chapter i'm just concising it to one page yes chalo okay chalo chalo yes okay bhargav i'll do that chalo mode of fertilization in case of bryophyte the mode of fertilization is water yes or no male gametes are released in the water they swim in the presence of the chemical they reach inside the archegonia and shows internal fertilization Hmm. Same goes for pteridophytes. That is why bryophytes are known as amphibians. Okay. Now here also water is required in pteridophytes. So pteridophytes can also be called as amphibians because pteridophytes also depends upon water for fertilization. Water internal. moving ahead in gymno angio no more dependence upon water the pollen grains are pollinated either with the help of wind or insects but they show internal fertilization internal fertilization plus pollen grains are pollinated either with the help of wind or with the help of animals like insects okay very good next point seed formation as everybody is saying seed 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 so in bryophytes no seed pterido no seeds gymnosperms they start producing seeds but their seeds are naked however in angiosperms well protected seed within the fruit wall so yahan pe kya likhoge covered seeds are produced yes or no correct i hope all these points are clear to each and every one of you if you remember this chart then surely your plant kingdom chapter is done just read it once just revise it once otherwise even if you remember this plus examples plus classification from your ncert done and dusted so with this my plant kingdom is over moving ahead with the next and very interesting chapter called morphology so this is a very very favorite chapter oh okay shrijan i'll do that surely i'll do that okay so diagram based questions in morphology chapter i students of i tell you na diagrams are very important in this chapter large numbers of diagrams are given so if you practice these diagrams well then surely your chapter will be your in your hand chalo so first is modification of roots now you know the major function of root is water mineral absorption but sometimes root can perform even other function other than absorption like storage of food like respiration like additional support etc so here are some modifications of root first i am going to talk about storage plants like asparagus turnip carrot radish all this you you enjoy asparagus you eat turnip you eat carrot you eat radish what are these 
these are simply root modification in their plant the root they start storing the excess food because of food because of which root becomes swollen it takes the shape of your vegetable and then you cut that plant you take that vegetable out and then you enjoy so if i talk about asparagus as well as yeah as well as turnip carrot and sweet potato all these are modification of root responsible for food storage food so a diagram b diagram both are showing storage of food now you have to remember one thing in case of turnip as well as carrot tap root modifies please remember this thing whereas in case of sweet potato adventitious roots modify stores food becomes healthy and yes then you take out that enjoy it okay coming to the c diagram what is the c diagram who will tell me yeah okay 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 listen to me what is the c diagram the c diagram shows nematophores now what are these nematoto nematophores these are some positively phototropic and negatively geotropic roots there which are found in some plants growing in marshy area like rhizophora but so marshy area mein that there's one trouble their soil is the, the the soil spaces they are packed with water because of which there is no proper aeration in the soil of marshy areas so there is lack of air in the soil hence roots they are not properly able to respire in that case the roots they start they start growing vertically upward and those roots which start growing vertically upward against the gravity towards the light are known as nematophores and they help in respiration so nematophores are the roots which help in respiration it is a modification of root which is observed in case of rhizophora okay chalo i hope you have understood this modification of root moving ahead next is the diagrams which are given in your ncrt for the modification of stem very good ayush very good sharan now uh, modification of stem similarly beta like you have studied for roots the main function of stem is conduction of water mineral pro uh, help provide the place for the attachment of leaves flowers fruits and etc but apart from this also stem can function it and apart from this if the stem is functioning then those are called as modification here are some diagrams which i am going to tell you what these signifies number 1 number 1 diagram signifies storage of food storage of food in the underground stem storage where in the underground stem potato it is a tuber yes or no ginger it is a rhizome so all these rhizomes tuber bulb and combs these are four different underground stem modification that are responsible for storing food very good jewel yes yes very good praveen so they are responsible for storage moving ahead b diagram here they are showing aerial stem modification it is aerial stem modification where the axillary buds they are getting modified to form what tendrils so these are tendrils when the axillary bud they modify to support for climbing tendrils and they help in climbing you observe in case of gods 
like in your cucumber and in your uh, bottle guard etc apart from this one more aerial stem modification is thorns stem thorns some in case of like citrus and bougainvillea for the case of protection the aerial stem like in citrus bougainvillea axillary bud remember modifies to form thorns for protection d diagram is showing subaerial stem modification this is showing subaerial stem modification the subaerial stem modification where just the stem which is present near the node from their roots arises and helps in vegetative propagation yes everybody so this third diagram this d diagram is responsible for showing you stem modification where vegetative propagation is involved so this is showing you the diagram of vegetative propagation i hope all these four diagrams are clear moving ahead with the next diagram which is of your leaf so structurally leaf is also one of the first of all morphological feature and structurally leaf is made up of three parts you can see the leaf base leaf lamina and the stalk of the leaf called as leaf petiole leaf base leaf stalk called as petiole and the green part of the leaf which you see called as lamina or blade right leaf base is that part with which the leaf is attached to the main stem correct then petiole is the stalk that keeps the uh, leaf fluttering in the wind and it allows the leaf to move up and down in the wind simply and the green part which you see is the lamina this lamina my dear student what it has it has arrangement of veins and veinlets it has several arrangement of veins and veinlets called as venation so next important term is venation okay now if i have used the term venation students then there will be two types of venation can you identify them can you tell me what is a and what is b anybody a venation here it is showing thick midrib in the center and then break out of number of veins and veinlets so this type of venation which you see in dicots is known as reticulate venation but if i talk about the second diagram where you see veins in the same direction direction all the veins are of same size no network all the veins are running parallel to each other very good magitha very good shubhadra shruti very good varman ayush yes so this is parallel venation which you see in case of monocots like banana okay cool yes yes very good very good varman now moving ahead with the next modification of leaf main function of leaf is to store is is to perform photosynthesis and can also help in vegetative propagation but if apart from this if leaf is performing some functions other function then that we talk under modification like for example leaves may get modified to store food so storage of food is one of the modification that you see in case of onions right so this onion is showing where leaves they become fleshy for storage purpose number one modification number second modification in plants like cactus 
the leaves they get reduced to spines why to avoid loss of water due to transpiration so it is one of the xerophytic modification where leaves they get reduced to spines so number 1 modification number 2 modification number 3 in case of pea matter in case of fabaceae members some of the members of fabaceae like pea they need tendrils for climbing because they are weak plants they are climbers so in case of pea what happens the leaf gets modified to form tendrils they modify to form tendrils so third modification is formation of tendrils tendrils which is responsible for climbing which provides support to the plant so these are the three major modifications apart from this one more modification is there phyllode an example of phyllode formation is in australian acacia commonly known uh, not commonly scientifically known as parkinsonia phyllodes right in which petiole gets modified and they start performing the function of leaf okay so these are certain modifications of leaf i hope all the diagram is clear prat kya bhai pratyav is asking ma'am how much marks is this with a मैम इस चैप्टर से कितने का नंबर का आता है हाँ दिस इज योर क्वेश्चन वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन एंड द आंसर विल बी बेटा दिस चैप्टर एवरी ईयर यू विल एटलीस्ट गेट वन और टू क्वेश्चन सो एट मार्क्स फ्रॉम दिस चैप्टर फॉर श्योर एंड यू नो द इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ एट मार्क्स सो प्लीज एंड स्पेसिफिकली फ्रॉम दिस चैप्टर क्वेश्चन आर आस्ट डायग्राम बेस्ड और दो एग्जाम्पल बेस्ड क्वेश्चन so if you have remembered the examples if you have remembered the diagrams then surely you will get your those eight marks okay moving ahead next is next diagram how many of you are able to identify this diagram how many of you are able to identify this diagram yes very very good very good so this diagram shows the different types of flower on the basis of their position of ovary on the thalamus there are three types of flowers on the basis of their position of ovary on the thalamus that is hypogynous also known as superior ovary second epigynous also known as inferior ovary third perigynous also known as half inferior ovary perigynous also known as half inferior ovary now what is first we'll discuss about hypogynous the first diagram shows hypogynous ovary hypo means above when ovary is placed in the top and all other whorls are arising below it so can you see ovary is at the top ovary is at the top and all other whorls are arising below it so ovary is superior all other whorls are hypo to it okay next is epi or inferior ovary in this in this diagram epigynous or inferior ovary like for example in guava cucumber epigynous ovary is present what do you mean by epigynous ovary epigynous ovary means when ovary is fused inside the thalamus and all other whorls are arising above it so see ovary is within the thalamus and all other whorls are arising above it okay third is peri or half inferior please do not use the term half superior no it is inferior half inferior neither superior nor inferior half inferior that is perigynous example plum peach rose very good sharan plum p 
पीच और रोज थ्री एग्जाम्पल प्लीज ओनली लर्न दीज थ्री एग्जाम्पल एनसीआरटी दैट्स इट चलो नाउ बी एन सी डायग्राम शोइंग यू पेरी गाइनस वेन ऑल द वर्ल्ड ऑफ द फ्लॉर दे आर राइट दे आर प्रेजेंट एट द सेम वर्ल्ड ओवरी ऑन द थैलमस एंड ऑल अदर वर्ल्ड फ्रॉम द रिम कैन यू सी ओवरी इज जस्ट ऑन द थैलमस and all other worlds are arising from the rim of the thalamus so you can say neither ovary is superior nor inferior it is actually every all the worlds are on the same level i hope this is clear to everybody botanist up erin oh yeah no 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 please erin they are not negative i thought you are calling me negative but no 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 beta don't say like that it hurts me okay so now next is types of estivation types of estivation means arrangement of different members like if first of all estivation term is only used for calyx and corolla that how the different members of the same whorl calyx and corolla are arranged with respect to each other okay there are four types of estivation number 1 you see is valvate example callotropis okay what happens in this valvate estivation all the members of the same whorl they are arranged in cyclical manner and none of the member are overlapping you see 2 3 4 5 so all the members are arranged in cyclical manner and none of the member ends are overlapping second twisted estivation b you see in case of lady finger what happens the members are arranged in cyclical manner but their ends are overlapping here ends were non overlapping but here the ends are overlapping in a regular fashion okay third is imbricate estivation as you see in case case of cassia gulmohar what happens the members of the same whorl they are overlapping but not in a regular fashion not in a regular fashion irregularly i hope with the help of diagram you can very clearly make out and the fourth one very good shubhrand uh, shubhadra madhan very very good fourth is your vexillary estivation which you specifically seen in the members of fabaceae their corolla arrangement in the members of fabaceae like p i'll tell you separately now first of all in vexillary estivation we are viewing the flower the whorls of the the members of the flower upside down as a result the lower most petal seems to be present at the top which is the largest and called as standard which encloses the two lateral wings in return these two lateral wings they encloses the two anterior most smallest keel fused keel keel to fused smallest and anterior most right so this is how vexillary estivation is all about this is the standard largest but posterior most okay i hope you have understood the concept of estivation as well now moving ahead with the next and very important segment that is types of placentation placentation means arrangement of ovules on the placenta correct so there are five different arrangements a is marginal can you tell me the example fabaceae members p right then next is 
एक्साइल प्लासेंटेशन यू सी इन केस ऑफ लेमन एंड सी इन केस ऑफ टमेटोज सी पेराइटल यू सी इन केस ऑफ ब्रासिकेसी फैमिली मस्टर्ड आर्जिमोन फोर्थ फ्री सेंट्रल दिस यू सी इन केस ऑफ डायंथस एंड प्रिमरोज वेरी गुड आयुष अमन वेरी गुड प्रवीण मार्गिथा वेरी गुड एवरी वन येस वेरी गुड एवरीबडी फ्री सेंट्रल यू सी इन केस ऑफ डायंथस एंड प्रिमरोज एंड लास्ट इज बेसल प्लासेंटेशन विच इज द मोस्ट एडवांस्ड विच यू सी इन केस ऑफ एडवांस्ड फैमिलीज लाइक फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन सनफ्लावर एंड मैरी गोल्ड करेक्ट सो आई होप ऑल द फाइव डायग्राम्स एंड देर प्लासेंटेशन एग्जाम्पल इज क्लियर टू ईच एंड एवरी वन वेरी गुड मदन प्रवीण वेरी गुड now moving ahead with the next important diagram which usually comes for labeling purpose is the diagram of monocot seed which seed maize seed this is very very important usually questions are asked from this diagram ab ye diagram what this diagram says this diagram says then in a monocot seed there are only three structures if i talk about monocot seed then structurally it consists of how many parts three parts first seed coat in case of maize seed coat is fused with the fruit wall so either you say seed coat or fruit wall one and the same thing second is embryo that if starts growing it develops into three part one cotyledon plumule and radical and third part is nutritive triploid endo sperm chalo dekhte hain structure mein yes very good okay chalo so this one is endosperm this one huge big is embryo that is having how many parts three part one cotyledon which is called as scutellum then plumule which is protected by coleoptile then radical from where root system arises that is protected by coleorhiza now macho endosperm and embryo they are separated from each other with the help of a triploid proteinaceous tissue called eluron layer it is triploid in nature proteinaceous separates endosperm from embryo right ujwal wait बच्चे फ्लोरल फॉर्मूलाज आर वेरी सिंपल उज्जवल आई थिंक आई एम नॉट कवरिंग टुडे राइट नाउ इफ यू रियली वॉन्ट टू जस्ट फोकस ऑन फ्लोरल फॉर्मूला देन आई हैव डन दिस इन माई वन शॉर्ट वीडियो इट विल हार्डली टेक यू टू टू थ्री मिनट्स देन प्लीज गो थ्रू दैट मॉर्फोलॉजी चैप्टर वीडियो वंस लास्ट सेगमेंट हार्डली आई थिंक इट विल टेक फाइव मिनट्स जस्ट कीप इन इन टू टू एक्स मोड एंड लिसन टू इट योर प्रॉब्लम विल बी सॉल्व आई हैव गिवन सम वेरी सिंपल टिप्स टू सॉल्व दोज थिंग्स आई होप यू विल अंडरस्टैंड दैट okay moving ahead so structure of monocot seed is done with this morphology chapter is also done moving ahead with the next chapter anatomy and in anatomy that day i remember many of the students many many of you were talking about ma'am secondary growth ma'am concept of secondary growth yes or no so today i am specifically going to teach you some important terms which is going to be very important for you if question comes from this section chalo okay little fast rajiv am i am i slow i think i am going too fast 
हाँ आई वॉन्ट टू ड्रिंक वॉटर बट एक्चुअली इट्स नॉट इन दिस रूम आई हैव टू गो नो इशूज नो इशूज इट्स ओके जस्ट जस्ट गिव मी अ मोमेंट ओके नो नो इशूज अभी माई एनाटमी इज वेरी गुड शारन इज सेंग माई एनाटमी इज वेरी गुड चलो ओके सो लेट स्टार्ट विथ कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ सेकेंडरी ग्रोथ फर्स्ट कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ सेकेंडरी ग्रोथ वी आर गोइंग टू डू सम लिटिल बिट थिंग्स अबाउट कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ सेकेंडरी ग्रोथ फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल सेकेंडरी ग्रोथ इज द फीचर ऑफ ग्रोइंग द थिकनेस ऑफ रूट एंड शूट स्पेसिफिकली इन डाइकॉट प्लांट्स मोनोकॉट्स दे डू नॉट शो सेकेंडरी ग्रोथ what is secondary growth secondary growth is that growth which is characterized by increase in the thickness of root and shoot presence of secondary growth is a characteristic features of some gymnosperms and dicots why the secondary growth takes place the secondary growth is taking place students due to the presence of secondary meristematic tissue called lateral meristem so first thing that you have to remember is what does secondary growth means secondary growth simply means increase in the thickness of the increase in the thickness of root and shoot of plant right theek hai it is found in some gymnosperms majorly in dicots third it is actually due to the presence of lateral meristem theek hai it is mainly due to the presence of lateral meristem now lateral meristem ke you have two examples one is vascular cambium and second is cork cambium there are two sub examples of vascular cambium that helps in secondary growth intrafascicular and inter fascicular so there is one intrafascicular cambium and second is interfascicular cambium right are bhai ayush from amazon i should call water yeah i'm not that rich that amazon specially will come and deliver me water in next 5 minutes right uh, okay so there are two examples of lateral meristem vascular cambium and cork cambium in vascular cambium there are further two examples that is intra fascicular and inter fascicular now i'll show you that how these cambium they help in secondary growth so first i'll remove this hole because i don't have my next page for this okay see first of all i'm going to talk about secondary growth in dicot stem that is very very important to understand the first step in secondary growth of dicot stem is formation of the vascular cambial ring formation of vascular cambial ring so initially in case of dicot stem if i cut the section of a dicot stem then what i will find the outermost layer called as epidermis the in the center there will be a large not large but yes pith will be present around which vascular bundles will be arranged in circular manner conjoint open type open means already they have intrafascicular cambium in each bundle okay now what happens the medullary rays which are present in between each vascular bundle the medullary rays which are present in between each vascular bundle they produce they undergo dedifferentiation to produce interfascicular cambium thus completing the ring so this is your interfascicular and green one is your intrafascicular together they form vascular 
cambial ring now this cambial ring it undergoes division it starts dividing to produce new cells which differentiate to form secondary xylem on the inner side and secondary phloem on the outer side more secondary xylem are deposited as compared to secondary phloem now because of this activity if more secondary xylem and secondary phloem will be formed then already existing primary xylem will start moving towards the pith and primary phloem will start moving towards the epidermis thus damaging the other tissues yahan jo tissues honge due to the movement of primary phloem they will start getting damaged now in order to heal that injury created due to the movement of primary phloem cork cambium develops from the cortical cells cork cambium then produces new cells on the outer side called cork that heals the epidermis and secondary cortex on the inner side to heal the dead cortical cells right so this is how whole secondary growth takes place once secondary growth is completed then let's see how the diagram of the dicot stem will look like so in the center there will be pith towards the pith will be present primary xylem then after primary xylem around primary xylem there will be several layers of secondary xylem which are crushing the primary xylem towards the pith followed that there will be cambial ring blue color means cambial ring right after cambial ring there will be layers of secondary phloem there will be pink color layer of secondary phloem then followed by primary phloem which is crushing the cortical and damaging the epidermal cells so here will be your which color should i use yeah here will be your cortical cells which is now damaged so cortical cells as well as your epidermal cells that also got damaged now to heal that some cortical cells will undergo de differentiation to form cork cambium so this green colored is cork cambium which produces new cells on the outer side called cork cells to heal the epidermal injury and some cells on the in inner side called secondary cortex to heal the cortical injury so this is pith primary xylem secondary xylem cambium then this is your secondary phloem followed by white color is primary phloem then this is your cortex green color is cambium cork cambium and then this is your epidermis clear i hope this whole diagram is clear to everybody right yes or no so this is all about the secondary growth which you have to remember and this is very very important with this we are going to move towards the next and very important chapter that is cell the unit of life in cell the unit of life some important things that we have to cover is first the structure of plasma membrane this structure of only 20 days left two days left yes 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 don't worry things things are just under control here you just give me some more time your whole botany will be revised and then you go to your home or whatever after my class gets over you stop revising botany and then you start studying zoology in other subjects and then you see how good you are going to score in your botany okay so here is structure of plasma membrane if i talk about the structure of plasma membrane many models were proposed but the most accepted one was fluid mosaic model explained by singer and nicholson in the year 1972 according to singer nicholson's fluid mosaic model plasma membrane is represented by lipid bilayer 
on which proteins are embedded so if you see the structure these two are the lipid layer lipid bilayer okay now these lipid bilayers they are associated associated with phosphate so we overall say phospholipid bilayer separately i'll also draw so according to singer and nicholson this is lipid bilayer on which proteins are embedded proteins are of two type okay this membrane structure singer and nicholson studied on human rbc where he found that 40% is lipid and 52% is protein remaining are sugar please remember this thing very very important coming back to the topic so in the topic i was telling you that on this lipid bilayer there are two types of proteins present some extrinsic protein and some intrinsic protein see peripheral protein only attached to the surface like this these are extrinsic protein but some protein you will see that are embedded in the membrane called integral protein so what are integral proteins the proteins which are completely embedded on the membrane very good riya yes very good ayush snega uh, i hope it will be done tomorrow don't worry it will be done tomorrow okay so coming back there are two types of proteins one present on the membrane called extrinsic another embedded within the membrane called as intrinsic proteins the main function of these proteins is to allow the movement of substances across the membrane now on these lipid molecules as well as proteins some sugar molecules can be attached can you see these sugar molecules wait let me use this color see this sugar molecules are attached so these if the sugar molecules are attached on the protein then that is called as glycoprotein and if these molecules are attached on the lipid then these sugar molecules are known as glycolipid here they are known as glycoprotein okay membrane also help also have cholesterol that helps in increasing the fluidity of the membrane cholesterol increase increases the fluidity of the membrane i hope that this structure is also clear to each and every one of you please the labeling is very important lipid bilayer structure is very important moving ahead to the next diagram of this chapter cell the unit of life is structure of mitochondria so but a mitochondria along with chloroplast these two are semi autonomous cell organelle why ayush no i'm not demotivated rather i'm just little bit kind of thirsty and little bit uh, getting tired yeah मैम बी एम एस एंड बी एच एम एस कट ऑफ कितनी होती है शेफ मार्क्स ऑफ आयुष कॉलेज वाई आर यू स्टिल थिंकिंग अबाउट बी एम एस एंड बी एच एम एस स्टूडेंट्स राइट नो नीट हैज नॉट बीन डन जस्ट जस्ट फोकस फॉर योर एम बी बी एस डोंट थिंक अबाउट बी एच एम एस एंड बी एम एस दैट तो यू विल डू यू ऑल आर सो गुड इनफ दैट यू विल गेट कॉलेज एंड बी एम एस एंड बी एच एम एस दैट इज नॉट अ बिग डील राइट नो योर मेन फोकस शुड बी ओनली ऑन एम बी बी एस राइट फॉर दैट ओनली यू आर प्रिपेयरिंग फॉर दैट ओनली आई एम वर्किंग सो हार्ड सो प्लीज स्टे कूल काम एंड डू नॉट थिंक अबाउट अदर डिग्रीज जस्ट फोकस ऑन योर एम बी बी एस एंड वंस यू फोकस ना डोंट जस्ट डोंट डिविएट योर फोकस हाँ अच्छा एर एन आई एम गेटिंग यू आई एम जस्ट ओके अच्छा अच्छा यू सेंग दिस टू भीम राज आई थोड़ी यू सेंग इट टू मी 
ओके आयुष आई गॉट इट हाँ यस शारन फॉर दैट या 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 नाउ डेज देर सो मच कॉम्पिटिशन स्टूडेंट्स आर वर्किंग सो हार्ड दे आर ब्रिंगिंग सेवन ट्वेंटी आउट ऑफ सेवन ट्वेंटी आई डोंट नो मतलब लिटरली यू पीपल हैव जस्ट रेज द लेवल ऑफ एग्जाम now the paper is coming is also so easy and students are working so hard that they are scoring 720 on 720 so that is why the cut off list the cut off marks has increased the bar of that cut off has increased to a lot of extent and this is the reason that nowadays even if you are scoring 650 then to you are not uh, <sighs> thank you sukumar thank you bachcha and uh, that is why you know 680 marks and 650 marks sometimes people don't get good colleges even when they are scoring more than 600 so now there's a huge competition there's a there's called a cutthroat competition now this is the scenario and if you really want to win in this cutthroat competition then uh, please please work hard everyone yes uh, today's class is all about final revision only yes yes uh, mainly my purpose of today's class was just to give a final revision of entire botany both 11th and 12th and i'll see that how much i get successful in this i hope uh, i cover whole 11th and 12th but if let's see what happens no shrikant nothing 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 okay chalo coming back structure of mitochondria so as i told you that both chloroplast and mitochondria are semi autonomous cell organelle that means they have origin they they can have independent existence and why do they why do why do we call them as semi autonomous there are certain reasons that why do we call them semi autonomous and the main reason of them being called as semi autonomous is presence of dna presence of their own ribosomes presence of uh, independent existence they can reproduce by fission method and so on and all these features it has thought that these mitochondria and chloroplast have originated from prokaryotic organism so majority of the points of mitochondria as well as chloroplast is similar to your uh, what to say is similar to your prokaryote okay i'll just uh daman hi good morning jasleen uh i'll give a small break but after doing this cell chapter first let's complete this cell chapter and then we'll just take a short break of 10 minutes okay yes chalo so structure of mitochondria if i talk about then mitochondria is a double membrane bound cell organelle there is a outer membrane and then there is a inner membrane inner membrane can you see is present in the form of infoldings see inner membrane is present in the infoldings which is called as cristae so inner membrane is present in the form of foldings called cristae correct now the space within the inner membrane the space is known as matrix which consist of dna double stranded circular single dna then they have ribosomes the nature of ribosome is 70s type and this matrix also have enzymes to perform oxidation of glucose in case of aerobic respiration that is for krebs cycle and link reaction okay now apart from this the space between outer and inner membrane is known as intermembranous space now on these finger like projections cristae they have some tennis racket shaped structures they have tennis racket shaped structures called oxisomes right oh wait 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 they have to be projected inward i'm sorry so they have some tennis racket shaped structures attached on the inner membrane which are called as oxisomes 
also known as F naught F one particles. Correct? Yes or no? Okay. So this is how the structure of mitochondria is. It is one of the semi-autonomous cell organelle. The main function of mitochondria is to produce energy. Hence, it is also known as powerhouse of the cell. Correct? And why it is semi-autonomous? Because it can show independent existence even outside the cell, as it has its own DNA, ribosome, ATP synthesizing machinery, and can divide by fission method. Coming to the structure of chloroplast. If I talk about the structure of chloroplast, then chloroplast is one of the form of plastid which is green colored and responsible for performing photosynthesis and storage of food. Okay, this chloroplast is also semi-autonomous. It is also thought to be of prokaryotic in origin, and it is also a double membrane bound cell organelle. It is also a double membrane bound cell organelle. See, like this. So one there is outer membrane, and then there is inner membrane. The space between outer and inner membrane. is known as intermembranous space and the space enclosed within the inner membrane is known as matrix right this matrix also known as stroma rather we can use the term stroma matrix we use it for mitochondria and stroma term we use for chloroplast within the stroma is present double stranded circular dna 70s ribosome as well as some coin shaped structures called thylakoids these thylakoids are present in piles one above the other the piles of thylakoid my dear student they are known as grana okay now granas are my dear student interconnected to each other they are interconnected to each other with the help of stroma lamella i'll see jayesh murli i'll see called as stroma lamella or fret channels stroma lamella or fret channel so this is how the structure of chloroplast is it is one of the form of plastid green colored responsible for photosynthesis i hope you have understood this yes or no why criste is zigzag shrikant criste is not zigzag rather it is the inner membrane which is criste is present in the form of finger like projection so that more surface area can be increased for better enzymatic activities okay iron is say <laughs> iron iron or iron i don't know how to pronounce your name iron uh, even if after revising you are forgetting na then please start eating almonds it is said that if your brain is so weak then almonds can only help you so ask your mother to give you some almonds lokeshwari wait 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 okay now coming to the next and the last topic of structure of uh, in sorry in the chapter cell the unit of life is structure of cilia and flagella this diagram is also given in your uh, ncrt that is why i'm taking up this uh, structure today in the class cilia and flagella cilia and flagella my dear student in case of eukaryote they are made up of microtubules they are made up of tubule and protein rather than arising from the membrane they arise from special structures called basal bodies basal bodies that arise from centrioles they are also made up of microtubule but their arrangement is 9 plus 0 from the 9 plus 0 arrangement of basal body comes the 9 plus 2 arrangement of cilia or flagella so cilia and flagella they are made up of tubulin protein which joins together to form microtubule in the cytoplasm
from the microtubules there is organization called 9 plus 0 that is responsible for making the basal bodies and from basal bodies arises cilia and flagella with 9 plus 2 arrangement the main function of cilia and flagella is locomotion now what does 9 plus 2 means what do you mean by 9 plus 2 9 means 1 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 sets of doublet on the periphery and 1 pair of doublet in the center. 9 plus 2 arrangement. Chha, kaj, Kalal, what are you saying? Delayed NEET UG 2022 next week Sunday. Who is saying this? Why are you spreading uh, the such information? Huh? Kalal. Okay, chalo, come back to the topic. So, there are what? There are 9 pairs of doublet on the periphery followed by 1 pair of doublet on the center. So, this is your... No, 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 Ayush. This is not at all real. I don't think so it is real. Yeah, fake news. And all these doublets are connected to the center peripheral... Uh, center doublet with the help of radial spokes. So, the structure of cilia flagella is 9 plus 2. You should remember this structure. Very, very important. Okay? Chalo. So, now I will be giving you a break. So, before starting with cell cycle and cell division chapter, I will be giving you a break of 10 minutes. What is the time right now? Somebody tell me the time now. So, time is 1 o'clock. Now I'll be me I'll meet you at 1:10. Okay? So yes, it is a break time. Have water and come back. Okay? Chalo. So it's a 10 minutes break for everybody and then uh, we'll come back and uh, we'll join the session soon. Chalo. Bye bye everyone. Don't say bye bye, come back soon.
ओके सो वेलकम बैक आफ्टर द स्मॉल ब्रेक आई होप यू ऑल कैन सी मी वंस अगेन सो येस येस यू ऑल आर स्क्रीमिंग मैम 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 डोंट वरी सो येस मैम इज बैक वंस अगेन पीयूष चलो सो लेट स्टार्ट विद न्यू चैप्टर दैट इज सेल साइकिल एंड सेल डिविजन इन दिस चैप्टर वी आर ओनली गोइंग टू डिस्कस वन इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग दैट इज कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ माइटोसिस एंड कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ मियोसिस हाँ आ गई मैम यस यस हाय जय श्री या वेलकम बैक सो वेलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू ओके सो नाउ वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट विद द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ माइटोसिस एंड मियोसिस सम बेसिक टिप्स आई एम गोइंग टू गिव यू इफ इन दिस चैप्टर सो दैट यू कैन सॉल्व न्यूमेरिकल बेस्ड क्वेश्चंस इफ दे आर आज फ्रॉम दिस सेक्शन बट बिफोर स्टार्टिंग विद द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ माइटोसिस एंड मियोसिस आई हैव वन मोर थिंग टू डिस्कस दैट इज डायग्रामेटिक व्यू ऑफ सेल साइकिल चैप्टर now the cell cycle if i talk about can be broadly divided into two phases the preparatory phase which is called as interphase and the second is the dividing phase which is known as the m phase suppose if i talk about a human cell that requires 24 hours for division then out of 95 24 hours 95% of those 24 hours they are consumed in interphase itself so this interphase takes about 95% of the total time whereas if i talk about m phase then m phase only takes less than 5% of the total time of cell division हाँ डोंट वरी आरव आई जस्ट गिव यू अ स्मॉल मंत्रा टू सॉल्व द न्यूमेरिकल बेस्ड क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम माइटोसिस एंड मियोसिस बट बिफोर दैट ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड द सेल साइकिल दिस डायग्राम लास्ट टू लास्ट ईयर क्वेश्चन वॉज आस्ड ऑन दिस डायग्राम सो प्लीज स्टे फोकस्ड सो इंटरफेस इज द प्रिपरेटरी फेज विच कैन बी सब डिवाइड इन टू थ्री फेजेस जी वन एस एंड जी टू S phase is characterized by the synthesis of, or uh, S phase is rather characterized by the duplication of centriole in the cytoplasm and replication of DNA without changing the number of chromosome. Coming to M phase, M phase can be divided into two steps. First is nuclear division called as karyokinesis, and then followed by the cytoplasmic division. called as cytokinesis okay karyokinesis again can be divided into four steps prophase metaphase anaphase and telophase so these are the four stages of karyokinesis followed by cytokinesis now imagine this is my one parent cell if this one parent cell will completely divide will complete the cell cycle then it will divide itself to produce two new daughter cells and this whole cycle is this whole chart is cell cycle which is divided into interphase and m phase right first interphase in three stages g1 s g2 so this much this blue color circle which you see is actually interphase this black color you see is m phase that is divided into two sub stages karyo and cyto karyo again into four sequence prophase metaphase anaphase telophase and then cytokinesis once this whole steps of cell cycle is done then the parent cell divides into two new daughter cell now suppose if the cell does not wants to divide if cell does not wants to divide then it can escape the cell cycle through g1 phase and can enter into a non dividing stage called g0 also known as quiescent and if suppose if cell is already there in quiescent stage g0 phase but still it wants to divide so it can re enter the cell cycle through g1 phase so g1 phase is the phase from where cell can escape from the cell cycle or can re enter the cell cycle as and when required so i hope that this diagram is clear to everybody now coming back to the concept of mitosis and meiosis bachcho there are two ash 
okay so there are two types of karyokinesis there are two ways by which nuclear division can be performed one is mitosis and second is meiosis if i talk about mitosis type of karyokinesis then it is actually students it is actually equational cell division that means one parent cell usually divides into two daughter cells and both the two daughter cells are going to receive the same amount of genetic material as that present in the parent so we can say that two equal daughters are being produced from one parent cell hence mitosis is known as equational cell division why it is known as equational cell division check it out suppose this is a parent cell a diploid parent cell having two complete sets of chromosome and two c amount of dna now this parent cell wants to divide so first before dividing it will enter into interphase it will enter into preparatory phase which is characterized by g1s and g2 suppose the cell enters into g1 phase so what will happen there will be no change in the number and the amount of dna it will remain as 2n 2c now after completing g1 phase it will enter into s phase where the number of chromosome will remain the same however the amount of dna will get doubled so the number will remain same 2n but the amount of dna will get doubled from 2nc condition will become 4c now this cell will enter into g2 again chromosome number remains the same but amount of dna has already doubled so from 2n the condition so from 2c condition has become 4c now from g2 now it will enter into m phase that is karyokinesis and cytokinesis after completing karyo and cyto this parent cell will divide into two daughter cells and both the daughter cells receiving same amount of dna and same a number of chromosome as that of parent right yes or no so it will receive two complete sets of chromosome with 2c amount of dna and same goes with another parent 2n 2c condition so both the daughters are identical to each other as and as that of their parent 2n 2c because of which this is known as equational cell division okay yes or no okay hi morya how are you yes very good arav okay acha rajiv is saying acha i like that now moving ahead with the second type of karyokinesis meiosis meiosis my dear student overall it is a reductional cell division why it is known as reductional cell division because if the parent is diploid with 2c amount of dna then after completing the whole meiosis at the end four daughter cells are received each having half the amount of dna and half the amount of chromosome as that present in the parent so number of chromosome and the amount of dna in the daughter cells get reduced to half that is why this type of karyokinesis is known as reductional cell division kya bolte hain that is why it is known as reductional cell division now my dear students meiosis can take place in two steps meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 so to cover meiosis whole soul there are two steps meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 right meiosis 1 if i specifically talk about then this is reductional division meiosis 2 is same as that of mitosis that is equational division correct chalo then let's try to understand with the help of the diagram now suppose i am having a parent cell which is 2n initially with 2c amount of dna like this okay 
now what will happen before starting with any type of division first preparation is required yes or no and if preparation is required then the first stage of preparation is g1 so this cell if it will enter into g1 some changes will take place but the amount of dna and chromosome will remain same after completing g1 it will then enter into s phase where duplication or replication of genetic material take place without changing the number of chromosome the number of chromosome will remain the same but the amount of dna will get doubled that means if here 46 chromosome are there with 20 amount picogram of dna then in g1 number will remain 46 amount will remain same however in s phase the amount will become double 40 picogram and the number of chromosome will remain still 46 i want to say this after completing s phase now it is going to enter into g2 phase from g2 phase also condition is going to just remain the same no change apart from some duplication of cell organelles 46 chromosome and 40 picogram of dna now after g2 phase now it will enter into meiosis 1 that is your prophase 1 leptotein zygotein pecaitin diplotein dikinesis metaphase 1 anaphase 1 telophase 1 cytokinesis 1 so after doing all those steps finally diploid parent cell will divide into two haploid daughter cell each receiving half the number of chromosome and half the amount of dna so in meiosis 1 actually you observe reduction uh sorry sorry students for the slight disturbance uh there was some uh, power cut at my home and uh, because of which my system got uh, disconnected yeah 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 i am back <laughs> so sorry sorry so 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 sorry everybody okay so i hope you all are back once again yeah yeah ma'am is here only now am i audible properly okay 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 
everything is understood yeah thank you there are some uh, that is why these are some on uh, technical glitches that may happen sometimes no issues no worries let's come back to the topic once again okay so i hope you have understood meiosis one which is which is your reductional division clearly ma'am okay thank you power star yeah thank you helen verman okay i hope i am now audible once again yeah josh should be hi thank you kajal thank you samuel chalo it's okay it, it's good you you got one more 5 minutes break uh, yeah yeah i'll continue thank you everyone thank you so much i hope you all uh, you all just got some extra 5 minutes break now meiosis one is done meiosis one is purely your reductional cell division but after completing meiosis one the cell also has to show meiosis two and for that the two daughter cells which are obtained over here they will first undergo a short lived preparatory phase which is known as interkinesis interkinesis is slightly different from normally interphase because during interkinesis there is no dna replication during interkinesis everything happens but without dna replication there is no dna replication happening hence the number of chromosome as well as the amount of dna will remain the same now what will happen now these two daughter cells will enter into m2 m2 which is exactly same as mitosis which is exactly same as equational cell division here each daughter cell now will behave as parent cell and will divide to produce two new daughter cells in all there will be four haploid daughter cells each receiving half the amount of dna so total number of amount of dna in this case will become 10 10 10 picogram and the number of chromosome will remain 23 23 23, 23. so at the end you obtain complete four haploid daughter cells and half the amount of dna is received as that of parent parent was 46 20 and four daughter cells obtained which are 23 and with 10 picogram of dna so if you remember this concept then numericals at least you can solve them easily theory you can read it from your ncrt it will be more than sufficient and if you remember this chart if you have written this chart then all numerical based questions will be done you will easily solve them you can try any one question you using this chart and you see your answer will come okay now moving ahead so this much is there for your cell cycle chapter now moving ahead we are entering into physiology and in physiology we are going to discuss the first chapter that is transport in plants okay so first i'm going to talk about transport in plants beta transport in plant this chapter is all about that how plants conduct water mineral from the roots to the leaves with the help of xylem and how prepared food is translocated from leaves to different parts of plant body with the help of phloem correct so first time we are going to see that how xylem conducts water and then we will see how phloem conducts food if i talk about conduction of water mineral with the help of xylem that that can be done in two ways good afternoon uh, what is this name gangadhar ha huh. good afternoon gangadhar okay so the two ways to conduct water and mineral or any but the two ways for transportation short distance transportation and long distance transportation in short distance transport i mean cell to cell movement of material that can be done by three ways simple diffusion facilitated diffusion and active transport this chart is also given in your ncrt and this chart is also very very important 
now here all the three types of short distance transport are there on your screen in a comparative mode yes easy peasy yes okay so first is proteins required so if i talk about simple diffusion simple diffusion simply means movement of water molecule along the cut sorry movement of any molecule why to specify only water so in simple diffusion there is movement of molecules along the concentration gradient without involving any proteins or any membrane so in case of simple diffusion there is no proteins involved but if i talk about facilitated and active transport the movement of material takes place with the help of proteins located on the membrane so here you will have to specify yes and for simple diffusion you will specify no second highly selective selective means what selective means ab uh, wherever proteins are involved for the movement then proteins my dear student they are highly selective they are highly specific for the movement of material across the living membrane if suppose there is a protein if there is a carrier protein which has specific receptor site for sodium so that carrier protein will only allow the movement of sodium it will not let potassium to move across it so wherever proteins are required for the movement that type of simple uh, that type of short distance transport becomes specific highly selective okay so no for simple diffusion but yes for facilitated and yes for active right moving ahead third is transport saturation now wherever proteins are involved my dear students their saturation will also come like for example if suppose on the membrane there are two sodium channels so two sodium channel at a time will only pump two sodium channel two sodiums so third sodium has to wait for its opportunity to arrive okay so wherever proteins are involved in short distance transport their saturation will come but in case of simple diffusion if i talk about then there will be no saturation as no proteins are involved in this case so no 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 next uphill uphill means against the gradient if i talk about simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion in both the cases movement of substances is taking place along the concentration gradient in a downhill manner so uphill transport no for simple diffusion no for facilitated diffusion but if i talk about active transport there movement of molecules takes place against the concentration gradient in a uphill manner so here there will be yes no and no okay now wherever uphill movement is taking place their energy has to be spent and if the movement is downhill along the concentration gradient then there will be no requirement of energy so in case of simple diffusion no atp is required in case of facilitated diffusion no atp is required but if i talk about active transport then there atp has to be spent atp is required so here your answer will be yes so students if you remember this chart then short distance transport is there on your tips moving ahead in this chapter there's one simple uh, diagram which you can see on your screen showing osmosis how many of you are able to recognize this diagram this diagram is of osmosis osmosis is a special type of diffusion where movement of solvent molecules occurs along the concentration gradient without the expenditure of energy without the expenditure of energy there is movement of solvent molecules through a semi permeable membrane so here two chambers have been shown to you there is a a chamber and b chamber and both the chambers they are separated with the help of a semi permeable membrane right now you have to tell that which direction movement of molecules water molecule will take place so tell me 
yes very good iron can you tell me in which direction the movement of molecules water molecule will take place so bachcho in case of a solute concentration is less but if i talk about chamber b then their solute concentration is high the, these molecules they are resembling solute so here solute concentration is high in a chamber solute concentration is low that means you can say that a chamber is hypotonic and b chamber is hypertonic right that means water concentration in a chamber is high and water concentration in b chamber is low very good varman very good uh, everyone those who are answering shrikant why beta so the movement of water molecule in this case the movement will be along the concentration gradient where solvent concentration is high to that region where solvent concentration is low that is from a to b so here the movement of molecules will be from a to b you can say that water potential of a is high and water potential of b is low so the movement of water molecule will be from a to b correct will you be able to solve questions related to it yes ma'am very good now moving ahead with the next topic showing the movement of water now we are talking about long distance transport that how water moves upward if it is long distance transport then there are two ways for the movement of water if i talk about long distance transport one is symplast and another is apoplast so now let's try to understand what do you mean by symplast and apoplast right there are two ways how water can move from the roots to the xylem if it is a long distance transport one is apoplastic method and second is symplastic method apoplastic means movement of water molecule through the dead regions of the cell mainly cell wall and intercellular spaces correct so can you see this the dark brown one which i am right now yellowing if the water is moving through the intercellular spaces or through the cell wall without entering inside the cell then that type of movement is known as apoplastic movement right but if the water is moving from the cell crossing the cell to cell with the help of plasmodesmata that means if the water is moving through the living region of the cell like this then this movement of water is known as symplast so what is symplast and apoplast these are two methods for the movement of water in case of apoplast water is moving through the dead regions of the cell that is either through cell wall or intercellular spaces and if i talk about symplast then the movement is taking place through the cell with the help of plasmodesmata movement through the cell now can you tell me which is better apoplast or symplast see for the movement of pure water in which minerals are very less dissolved so apoplast is better because in apoplastic movement no energy expenditure is required and movement is also fast so this apoplast is passive in nature and comparatively a faster process as the movement of water need not to face any kind of resistance during its movement but if i talk about symplast then in case of symplast my dear 
okay so in case of symplast if i talk about then in symplast the movement of water molecules is occurring through the cell where the resistance is being offered to the movement of water as a result the movement becomes active and since the resistance is offered to the movement of water so water movement also becomes comparatively slower movement will become slower so if water is moving symplastically then that movement is slow and if water is moving apoplastically then it is moving comparatively faster okay symplastic movement is only 4% of the total water only 4% of the total water is moving symplastically but if i talk about apoplastic movement then it accounts for the major movement of water which is approximately 96% okay so 96% of the water is moving apoplastically and only 4% of the water is moving symplastically so you should know that there are two ways for the movement of water in long distance transport that is apoplastic and symplastic now moving ahead with the next oh yeah that is mechanism for the movement of prepared food with the help of phloem ab this concept this diagram explains you the mechanism for the translocation of prepared food with the help of phloem okay if i talk about specifically phloem then phloem is one of the complex permanent tissue that is responsible for carrying food from the source to the sink the major two components of phloem which is responsible for this activity is sieve tube and companion cells correct now the movement of what food through the phloem was explained by scientist munch munch was the scientist who explained the concept for the movement of prepared food along the pressure gradient and that theory is known as pressure flow hypothesis according to which the food moves along the pressure gradient in bulk hence it is also known as bulk flow hypothesis or mass flow hypothesis let's try to understand once what happens the source mainly the leaves source is preparing the food the prepared food from the source is actively loaded in the sieve tube cells because the sieve tube cells they receive the Uh, because of the loading process because of the active loading process sieve tube cells they receive the food as a result the concentration of solute in the sieve tube cell rises they become hypertonic because of which they push they pull the water from their adjacent xylem cells and because of the endosmosis process in the sieve tube cell the turgidity the pressure inside the sieve tube cell rises and because of high pressure on the above sieve tube cell the food is then pushed downward in the lower sieve tube cell now the lower sieve tube cell has received the food because of which its solute concentration has risen it has become hypertonic so again it will push the pull the water from the adjacent xylem cells and again the food will be pushed down same things will continue till the time sink cells are not achieved once the sink cells will be will arise then unloading active unloading of food will take place from the sieve tube into the sink cells with the help of companion cell during unloading all the solutes from the sieve tube will be given out condition will become hypotonic and then exosmosis will take place correct yes very good shiva very good shrikant yes uh, yes 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 very good sharan ayush okay so see what happens sugar enters the sieve tubes followed by endosmosis that results in the development of high turgor pressure as a result 
the food is going to move down and when the sink cells will arise then sugar will leave sieve tubes unloading will take place at the sink cells that will decrease the hypo that will decrease the solute concentration of the sieve tube cell making the condition hypotonic followed by exosmosis ma'am loading unloading yes both loading and unloading both are active processes you have to remember that both loading and unloading are active processes correct energy has to be spent once the food is coming inside the sieve tube or moving outside the sieve tube clear so you have to remember few points what is the function of phloem how is it performing so it is performing with the help of pressure flow hypothesis also called as mass flow hypothesis which was explained by munch and three things are happening active loading endosmosis movement along the pressure gradient unloading exosmosis that's it okay chalo now moving ahead with the next chapter that is mineral nutrition and in mineral nutrition the first and the foremost thing which is which, uh, which we are going to talk about is hydroponics hydroponics this technique which you can see on your board was actually proposed by scientist julius von sack julius von sack my dear students he proposed a new method of growing crop in a soil free medium in the absence of soil in a nutrient rich medium also we can culture crop and that technique is known as hydroponics so what is hydro hydro means water ponics means to grow hydro means water and ponic means to grow to culture right so julius von sack for the first time demonstrated that even in the absence of the soil we can culture crop mainly like some herbaceous plants not big big trees obviously some herbaceous plants can be easily cultured by the technique of hydroponics yes shiv in the near in mid 1860s so julius von sack performed this experiment during 1860s now what he did he simply prepared a nutrient rich medium he prepared a nutrient rich medium in a beaker nutrient rich medium means in water you are adding all the nutrients which are actually found in a soil and in known quantity so he prepared a defined nutrient solution what he prepared he prepared a defined nutrient solution correct so he prepared a defined nutrient solution and in this he covered this beaker with the help of a lid the lid was having three openings for the first opening he kept a stirrer inside it see this aerating tube the purpose of aerating tube is to properly mix the nutrient inside the yes yes shrikant if the ears are mentioned in ncert then you should know those ears it is very very important if the ears are mentioned in ncert please do remember them no need to miss them out okay chalo so aerating tube is mainly responsible for mixing the nutrients from the second opening funnel is being added the purpose of this funnel is to keep on adding the nutrients as and when required see this funnel right and third lid is for keeping your plant inside it which you have to grow and just keep it under the sun cover it with the, the cover the beaker with the black sheet to avoid any contamination and then all nutrients is being provided and care is being taken so the small plant will plantlet will start growing and this hydroponic technique commercially has been used to grow three important crops 
that is tomato seedless cucumber and lettuce if you know shilpa shetty kundra she is one of the very famous actress and she is a very proud owner of a hydroponic farm at her own house in her own house she is having a hydroponic farm where she cultures so many herbaceous plants like mints and coriander etc and it is a very good method to avoid soil instead of soil you are growing your uh, plants in cute cute vessels providing all the required nutrients okay i hope hydroponic technique is clear moving ahead with the next important topic of mineral nutrition chapter that is development of root nodules this is i hope i have left one page oh yeah very important topic in this chapter mineral nutrition my dear student see what happens this chapter is pure learning some roles of macronutrient micronutrient deficiency symptom toxicity all those things are given but the major portion where understanding where concept comes is actually your nitrogen cycle so let me try to decode this nitrogen cycle in a very simple and in a very quick manner see nitrogen cycle is very very important in our atmosphere 78% of nitrogen is there but that is not present in usable form very good shiv kumar choudhary ah thank you ayush okay so i was telling you about this nitrogen cycle in atmosphere nitrogen is 78% such a huge amount but still if i tell you that is not present in usable form so the way nitrogen atmospheric nitrogen can be made in usable form that process is known as nitrogen fixation conversion of atmospheric nitrogen into some usable compound is known as nitrogen fixation which can be done by three ways that is biological nitrogen fixation or electrical nitrogen fixation or industrial nitrogen fixation if nitrogen fixation is done with the help of living organisms then it is known as biological nitrogen fixation so here biological nitrogen fixation ki madad se atmospheric nitrogen is converted into ammonia and it comes in the soil so that plants can take them up and use them for protein synthesis however there is one trouble plant roots they plant roots they do not prefer ammonia for absorption okay so ammonia which is coming in the soil after biological nitrogen fixation the plants are not able to absorb them in that form for that we need to convert ammonia into some usable form like nitrate so conversion of ammonia into nitrate this step is known as nitrification so after biological nitrogen fixation once ammonia comes in the soil next step is nitrification where your ammonia is converted into nitrate now plants can directly use this nitrate they can absorb nitrate so from nitrate from the soil this nitrate will be picked up by the plants now from the plants it will be then passed to animal biomass now once plants and animals will die they will decay and during decaying ammonification will take place to release the ammonia back in the nature and nitrate which is there in the soil some part of nitrate is absorbed and some gets denitrified back into atmospheric nitrogen so this is how the nitrogen cycle operates first step is biological nitrogen fixation right first step is biological nitrogen fixation 
that converts atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia so now ammonia comes in the soil however plant is not able to use it so now we have to convert ammonia so now we have to convert this ammonia into first nitrite and then into nitrate this step is known as nitrification now once nitrate is being prepared it will be absorbed by the plants so next step will be uptake after uptake from plants it will be transferred to animals plant and animal parts will die they will decompose to release ammonia once again in the nature this process is called as ammonification however to complete the cycle the last step is denitrification where soil nitrate is being converted back into atmospheric nitrogen with the help of some so soil microbes like thiobacillus or pseudomonas these bacteria they help to convert nitrate back into atmospheric nitrogen and with this your nitrogen cycle is completed you started your cycle from atmospheric nitrogen you came back to atmospheric nitrogen after covering so many steps yes correct very shiv very good shiv okay now moving ahead with the next important topic in this chapter is nodule formation as i told you biological nitrogen fixation means conversion of nitrogen into ammonia with the help of living microbes living organisms these organisms can be of two type some microbes they fix nitrogen freely free in, freely free matlab without in the association of other organism they are called as free living nitrogen fixers but some organisms some microbes like rhizobium they will convert nitrogen into ammonia only when they form symbiotic association with other higher organisms like for example association of rhizobium with the roots of leguminous plants so rhizobium bacteria gets associated with the roots of higher plants with the roots of leguminous plant for fixing nitrogen and for this nodule formation has to take place okay 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 now so moving ahead development of root nodule in soya bean soya bean is a leguminous plant and these are the different steps on your screen where uh, yes where you can see how nodule formation takes place within the root cell once the rhizobium enters okay so in the first step you can see bacteria are there in the soil they get attached to the root hair because of the attachment of root hair the root hair it curls inward and lets the let the bacteria enters inside bacteria while entering inside they enter in a, in a proper manner which is called as infection thread this infection thread reaches to the cortical cell and in the cortical cell they induce the nodule formation where the nitrogen fixation takes place okay with this moving ahead next chapter is photosynthesis in higher plants now photosynthesis in higher plants we will get started with the next topic that is photosynthesis in higher plants now this is very important photosynthesis means simply means it is a chemical process by which green plants prepare their own food the green the method by which green plant prepare their own food is known as photosynthesis right now photosynthesis preparation of food is a huge step which can be done by two ways first is light reaction and second is dark reaction if i specifically talk about light reaction then light reaction can be proceeded by two ways one is non cyclic photophosphorylation and second is cyclic photophosphorylation okay now 
in case of non cyclic photophosphorylation the diagram is over here non cyclic photophosphorylation is also known as z scheme where two photosystems are involved ps1 and ps2 apart from two photosystems two enzymes are involved that is atp synthase and nadph2 reductase enzyme which are responsible for atp synthesis as well as nadph2 so this is one of the method of light reaction where light energy is converted into chemical form okay light energy is converted into chemical form and those two chemical forms are atp as well as nadph2 okay why during non cyclic photophosphorylation mahima yes of course if you listen to me carefully then surely you can score it just once whatever topics i am writing on my board i may not cover them completely but i am giving you the hint that these are the only important topics which you should revise before your examination if you revise these topics well then surely you will get good marks good ni i will say better marks in botany okay chalo so there are two ways of light reaction as i told you one is non cyclic another is cyclic in non cyclic two photosystems are involved and both the enzymes are involved to produce atp and nadph2 i hope you understand this diagram this is your non cyclic photophosphorylation also called as z scheme the another way is cyclic photophosphorylation where only one photosystem that is ps1 is involved and along with ps1 only one enzyme is involved which is atp synthase so during cyclic photophosphorylation only atp is synthesized there is no synthesis of nadph2 only atp is getting synthesized overall when light reaction operates the chemical the light energy is converted into chemical form that is atp and nadph2 once ah uh, yes nega surely yes yes absolutely now what i was saying is uh, okay so what i was saying there are two ways of performing light reaction overall during light reaction you obtain atp and nadph2 these end products of light reaction are then used for your dark reaction that operates in the stroma of chloroplast for converting co2 into glucose co2 is then finally converted into glucose by using atp and nadph2 now beta there are two types of plants that is c3 plants and c4 plants now in c3 plants and in c4 plants the major differences i am going to tell you now first of all this chart i have taken directly from your ncert book so this chart need to be there on your tips if you remember c3 and c4 then surely you will be able to solve that chart chalo let's try to solve along with me cell type in which kelvin cycle takes place if i talk about c3 plants then c3 plants they only have one type of cell called mesophyll their whole whole process takes place in mesophyll cell but if i talk about c4 plants then they have two types of cells arranged in a concentric manner bundle sheet and mesophyll however their kelvin cycle operates in bundle sheet cell next cell type in which initial initial carboxylation for c3 plants takes place in mesophyll but if i talk about c4 plants their primary carboxylation that is joining of co2 with pep also takes place in their mesophyll cells 
coming to the third how many cell types does the leaf have that fix co2 in c3 plant there are only one cell type that is mesophyll but if i talk about c4 plants then they have two types of cell whether that is mesophyll and bundle sheath so you have to write two which is the primary co2 acceptor in case of c3 plant it is a five carbon compound rubp but in case of c4 the primary co2 acceptor is a three carbon compound phosphoenol pyruvate next which is the primary co2 fixation product in case of c3 the primary co2 fixation product is a five uh, is a three carbon compound phosphoglyceric acid but in case of c4 plants the primary fixed product is a four carbon compound oxaloacetic acid moving ahead number of carbons in primary co2 fixation product three that is that is known as c3 plant in c4 plants the first oaa the first product is made up of four carbon compound next does the plants have rubisco my dear students rubisco is found in all plants b8 c3 c4 or cam rubisco is found everywhere next does the plant have pep case c3 plants they do not have pep case but c4 plants in their mesophyll cell in the cytoplasm of the mesophyll cell they do have pep case that help in primary fixation next which cells in the plants have rubisco so in case of c3 plants rubisco is found in mesophyll cells but in case of c4 plants it is found in their bundle sheath cell okay moving ahead next co2 fixation rate under high low or medium light conditions so co2 fixation rate under high light intensity for c3 plants will be comparatively low because under high light intensity c3 plants they start showing photorespiration but if i talk about c4 they are always they are adapted c4 plants are adapted to high light intensity even during high light intensity the co2 fixation rate remains high they do not show photorespiration next whether photorespiration is present at low light intensity but a low light intensity mein to c3 plants also show neglig negligible or sometimes they show photorespiration but if i talk about c4 plants in ka to always it is negligible whether photorespiration is present at high light intensity so yes negligible or even you can write sometimes but negligible is correct option next whether photorespiration would be present at low co2 concentration low co2 means high o2 and if there is high o2 concentration then rubisco will go and bind with oxy oxygen to show photorespiration high and here usually there is no such low co2 concentration if low co2 concentration is there but in bundle sheet cell they themselves are preparing their own co2 so they already always have high co2 concentration hence again negligible whether photorespiration would be present at high co2 concentration already if you're saying high co2 concentration then why rubisco will go and get bind with oxygen it will always bind with co2 to avoid photorespiration here no no temperature optimum temperature optimum for c3 plant is comparatively lower which is about 22-30 degree celsius right if i talk about c4 plants then it is between 30 to 40 because c4 plants they are adapted to high light intensities they are well adapted to high light intensities okay yes or no now examples c3 plant examples like your rice wheat and mustard uh, etc and for c4 plants maize sorghum sugarcane etc i hope you have under understood this chart and with this your photosynthesis part also gets over 
moving towards the next chapter that is respiration in plants so now let's move ahead with respiration in plants students usually i have found i have seen so many of you always facing trouble with ets you all know what is krebs cycle you all know what is glycolysis but the major section where student face trouble is understanding electron transport system so today i'm going to solve the simple trouble of electron transport system ets means product transfer of electron transportation of electron between various electron carriers in order to generate in order to generate atp so ets means transportation of electron through the electron carriers to generate atp ets runs not only on the inner membrane of mitochondria but it also runs on the thylakoidal membrane of chloroplast in order to generate atp correct so ets in case of mitochondria in case of respiration chapter will occur on the inner membrane of mitochondria why because this inner membrane of mitochondria has various complexes located complexes like you can see on the diagram this is your see this is your inner mitochondrial membrane i'll draw it separately also so that it becomes little bit more easy so suppose this is your inner membrane of mitochondria the space enclosed within inner membrane is known as matrix and the space present outside inner membrane is known as intermembranous space correct right now only i have told you the diagram of nc uh, of mitochondria now on this inner membrane are present different proton channels in the form of complexes how many complexes are there four complex 1 2 3 and 4 complex 1 known as nadh2 dehydrogenase complex 2 known as fadh2 dehydrogenase complex 3 known as cytochrome bc1 reductase and complex 4 known as cytochrome c oxidase apart from these four complexes it also has an enzyme which is atp synthase commonly called as complex 5 on the inner membrane of mitochondria now these complexes they are responsible for oxidizing the reduced nadh2 and fadh2 inka kya kaam hota hai oxidation of nadh2 and fadh2 while oxidizing nadh2 and fadh2 in the matrix these complexes they pump proton from the matrix in the ims because of the pumping of proton from the matrix in the ims during oxidation process there is generation of proton gradient the concentration of proton in the ims increases and in the matrix decreases because of this difference in proton gradient now what will happen now proton has become excess in ims and they have reduced in matrix so what will happen now this gradient will be broken down with the help of complex 5 which is atp synthase now atp synthase will push back all the extra proton every time one pair of proton will go back to generate atp to generate atp so when one molecule of nadh2 is oxidized three atp are produced and when one molecule of fadh2 is oxidized two molecules of atp are produced remember this thing one nadh2 say 3 atp and from 1 fadh2 2 atp are produced so now see this diagram
complex one see what is this doing what what this complex one is doing it is oxidizing nadh2 while doing this it is pumping proton how many four proton from the matrix in the ims correct similarly complex 3 it is helping in transportation of electron meanwhile pumping proton from the matrix in the ims and because of all these activity protons are being pumped from the matrix in the ims developing the gradient which is then broken by this complex 5 that is enzyme atp synthase to produce atp so simply you have to remember in ets that what is the purpose of ets production of atp where it is happening in mitochondria on the inner membrane how the complexes are located on the inner membrane which are responsible for pumping the proton from the matrix in the ims because of which the concentration of proton in the ims increases gradient established now this gradient is then broken down by the enzyme atp synthase how by pumping every time one pair of proton back in the matrix correct when this is happening from every one pair of proton one molecule of atp is generated in this manner if one nadh2 is getting oxidized three atp will be produced and if one molecule of fadh2 is getting oxidized two atp will be produced simple as this if you remember this much conceptual questions as well as numerical based questions you will be able to solve them this much is there for respiration now moving ahead with the next chapter that is plant growth and development in this chapter specifically i am going to tell you about only one topic that is photoperiodism because this is little bit understanding otherwise remaining thing in this chapter are purely learning based you have to learn the you have to learn the roles of different hormones oxygen gibberellin and all that yeah yeah bhargav we'll do that as well hmm okay okay so in this chapter i'm going to mainly tell you about the concept of photoperiodism rest in this chapter as i told you is purely learning based what do you mean by photoperiodism photo means light periodism means duration of exposure so there were two scientists garner and ellard these two people they were working on some tobacco plant species called maryland mammoth what they observed that this plant this maryland mammoth this tobacco variety easily flower during winters but it fails to flower during summers however if this plant is kept for 16 hours in darkness artificially during summer also then to it start flowering so garner and allard said that definitely there is some requirement of light and dark duration so into in order to induce flowering in my tobacco plant in winters they are naturally flowering no external condition is required varman ma'am where is the josh josh ma'am yes yes that is why yes uh, shubhadra i have only selected the important topics yeah very good adi very good thank you okay very good everyone chalo so i'm i was just telling you about photoperiodism so if i talk about photoperiodism then photoperiodism simply tells you the method of flowering the method of flowering which depends upon the duration of light exposure every plant has their own specific yeah thank you varman i literally just need that boost up yes yes okay 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 chalo 
so i'll tell you that what is what is this photoperiodism photoperiodism simply means the mechanism of flowering which is induced in the plants by giving them proper exposure to light right every plant requires a specific duration of light exposure in order to induce flowering in them this is called as photoperiodism photo the concept of photoperiodism was introduced by garner and ellard while they were working on a short day plant called maryland mammoth it is a tobacco variety what they observed they observed when the plants are exposed naturally to winter conditions they are flowering but during summers they fail to flower under natural condition however if they are given artificially 16 hours of darkness and only 8 hours of light then they flower properly that means these plants these tobacco varieties they require very less exposure to light and long exposure to darkness in order to induce flowering in them yes or no correct so this concept of flowering which is dependent upon duration of exposure to light and dark is known as photoperiodism and on the basis of this there are three types of plant long day plant short day plant and day neutral plant if i talk about long day plants then you can see on the first screen long day plants are those who require longer duration of exposure to light more light less darkness are known as long day plant on the other hand are short day plant short day plants are those who requires less amount of light but more amount of darkness like your tobacco plant in tobacco plant my dear students 16 hours of darkness was required and only 8 hours of light so when such plants are known as short day plant third category is day neutral day neutral means whatever condition you give whatever duration of light and dark you give they are going to flower under all conditions so day neutral are in hindi we call them sada bahar even they flower during winters even they flower during summers but long day will specifically flower during summers and short day will specifically flower during winters this concept of photoperiodism was launched by garner and ellard the hormone responsible for flowering is known as florigen and leaves they have a specific pigment responsible for trapping light in order to induce flowering leaves they have a special pigment called phytochrome so leaves are the site for the perception of light to induce flowering how because they have a special pigment called phytochrome i hope you will remember all these things what is periodism garner ellard phytochrome long day short day and day neutral so with this class 11th portion is done i'll just take uh yes karak varman so i'll just take a break of next 10 minutes and then we will resume with class 12th topics that is reproduction in organism so it's just a break of next 10 minutes what is the time right now let me just check the time yeah so it's 232 so almost class 11th is done so time is 232 we'll meet at 245 and then we will resume class 12th topics cool chalo then you can have a rest yeah it's a just a 10 minutes break you all can have rest and then come back with full josh i'll also come with full josh josh to start with class 12th topics okay chalo ashwin i don't know tamil sorry my dear bye bye everyone see you after 10 minutes
okay so once again back i hope you all are joining fast so yes you all can come back uh, ma'am is once again back now we are going to start with the class 12 syllabus almost 11th is done and now we are going to start with the first chapter of class 12 that is reproduction in organism my dear students this chapter is very very simple and the major portion of this chapter you already do in morphology when it comes to asexual reproduction i have only picked the one very small topic from this chapter that is the structure of cara cara is a plant it's one of the and uh, not even sorry a plant it's rather a green algae why have i picked this topic because usually students study everything yeah welcome back uh, sharon yeah so once again welcome back to you all let's start with this why ha i was telling you that why have i picked this topic cara because usually students they study everything but they miss those points from where questions has to be asked and cara is one one is one such section from where questions are usually asked so you should understand the structure of this green algae cara over here which is there on the screen chalo let's start so as i already told you cara is a green algae it is a monoecious green algae monoecious means on the same body both the sex organ male as well as female is present the female sex organ which is present on the upper region on the upper half is known as oogonium whereas the lower which is seen in a spherical ball like structure is known as anthridium or globule globule is the male sex organ whereas this is the nucule also called as oogonium that is the female sex organ nucule so cara are usually monoecious in nature why because both the sex organ are born on the same plant even when both the sex organs are born on the same plant but still they show cross pollination because cara exhibits protandry protandry means that the male sex organ mature first than female sex organs the male sex organ release the biflagellate flagellate motile male gamete outside the water meanwhile the female gamete is still not ready so that condition is where male gamete matures first than female gamete very good orchid ha huh. so what i was telling you that the male sex organ it matures first in case of cara as compared to female sex organ hence this is known as protandrous condition and cara exhibits protandry because of which even after monoecious they prefer cross fertilization they prefer cross fertilization okay yes or no and cara are usually monoecious only one exception is there cara valishi so one species of cara that is cara valishi is a only dioecious species apart from other monoecious species so this thing you have to remember sometimes the diagram for identification comes sometimes the question is going to come for for the labeling purpose as well so that is why i have picked this topic you usually miss this and i thought why not to pick this topic from this chapter moving ahead with the next chapter that is sexual reproduction in organism uh, in flowering plants sexual reproduction in which organisms in flowering plants this chapter is a very easy and a very scoring chapter what are the things that we cover under this chapter first is formation of male gamete then formation of female gamete once male and female gametes are produced then third topic comes transfer of male gamete to the female gamete so that fertilization can takes place so that event of transfer of male to female gamete is known as pollination after pollination is done then next comes fertilization once fertilization is done once the zygote is produced then comes fruit formation seed formation so this chapter is all about formation of gametes transfer of gametes 
एंड फ्यूजन ऑफ गैमीज करेक्ट मैम मेरे बायो में तीन अरे बिल्कुल आ यस यस शार एंड श्योरली यू विल स्कोर दैट गुड मार्क्स इन बायो एंड इवन इफ यू स्टडी वेल स्टिल आई विल से वन और टू डेज आर स्टिल लेफ्ट इन योर हैंड सो यस यू कैन डू इवन बेटर हाउ मच इज द वेटेज वन दिथ इज आस्किंग मैम हाउ मच इज द वेटेज ऑफ दिस चैप्टर विथ चैप्टर आई थिंक यू आर टॉकिंग अबाउट सेक्शुअल रिप्रोडक्शन राइट सो वन दिथ इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट चैप्टर usually uh, in class 12 if i talk about 3 to 4 chapters are important genetics part 1 genetics part 2 and sexual reproduction is also equivalently equivalently important yes vandit it is important hi durjay good evening i the hope i erin is saying humans are protogynous humans uh, yeah i think you can say because in us the gamete formation eggs they are produced maybe but i am not sure <laughs> ask in your zoology class chalo okay let's start so first in the first diagram you see that how i am going to make you understand the structure of anther where formation of male gamete has to take place so first thing which we are going to study over here is structure of anther where the pollen grains are going to be produced the male sex organ in a flower is androecium commonly called as stamen stamen structurally consist of three part anther filament and connective connective is that structure that joins the two lobes of anther anther is the main site for the formation of pollen grains structurally if i talk about mature anther then mature anther is surrounded by four layers of anther wall layer the four wall layers of anther from outer to inner are epidermis this is the outermost protective layer of anther followed by followed by endothecium endothecium is the layer which is present below epidermis which is mainly involved in dehiscence of anther coming below endothecium are two to three layered middle layers which are ephemeral in nature and no as such function is assigned to them and talking about the innermost layer followed by middle layer is tapetum tapetum is nutritive in nature the main role of tapetum is to provide nutrition to the developing pollen grains these are microspore mother cells which will undergo meiosis to produce microspore that is pollen grains and nourishment to those pollen grains is provided by tapetal cells so how many layers are there four very good orchid so number one outermost is epidermis followed by endothecium followed by middle layer and then followed by tapetum so in a mature anther four wall layers are present outer to inner i hope you all have understood moving ahead towards the next very important diagram i can guarantee this diagram is there in your paper sunday just check and let me know whether this diagram is coming has came or not here you see the structure of ovule the most common type of ovule called anatropous ovule which is found in majority of the angiospermic family ovule also called as megasporangium it is that structure where meiosis takes place for the development of female gametophyte embryo sac if i talk about structurally the most common ovule anatropous ovule is actually inverted structurally if i tell then it is inverted ovule inverted means upside down whatever thing has to come above will be visible to you below and vice versa so structurally ovule consist of how many parts chalaza chalaza represents the base of the ovule see this is your anatropous ovule chalaza represents base of the ovule so i am also drawing along with the main diagram so this is the base of the ovule chalaza but it seems to be at the top because this is anatropous ovule inverted ovule correct the stalk of the ovule with which it is attached 
to the placenta is known as funicle right the coverings of the ovule are known as integuments maybe one integument or maybe two integuments followed by this there are some nutritive tissue present within the integument called as nucellus one of the cell of the nucellus will grow in size to behave as megaspore mother cell which will undergo meiosis to produce four haploid megaspore usually out of which three gets degenerated one remains functional and that one megaspore will develop the complete embryo sac which is the female gametophyte so here is your female gametophyte called as embryo sac right and within this embryo sac seven celled eight nucleate structure is present seven celled eight nucleate i am repeating it again that so this is the most common type of embryo sac called as polygonum type correct the seven cells are three antipodals right central one secondary cell which is fused from the two polar cells followed by egg apparatus consisting of one egg cell and two synergids so overall seven cells are there but if i talk about number of nuclei then there are eight how three antipodals haploid one central cell diploid five nuclei three egg apparatus haploid five plus three eight correct yes or no very good orchid very good sharan keep it up so this is the embryo sac which carries the female gamete for the fertilization very good sharan so this is how the anatropous ovule with all the labelings are there in front of your screen ovule is also known as megasporangium now moving ahead with the embryo sac that i have already explained you this is a mature embryo sac this is a mature female gametophyte that is seven celled eight nucleate this type of embryo sac my dear students is known as is known as what is known as polygonum type the most common type of embryo sac polygonum type see antipodals right towards the chalazal end center the two polar nuclei which will later fuse to form one large central cell followed by three celled three nucleate egg apparatus consisting of one egg and two synergids synergids they have filiform apparatus finger like projections called filiform apparatus that helps to guide the entry of pollen tube so pollen tube is going to bring the male gametes and will discharge inside the embryo sac through filiform apparatus clear i hope this diagram is clear in everybody's mind moving ahead with the next diagram where proper pollen pistil interaction is being shown see this diagram this is a longitudinal section this is a ls of a flower showing growth of pollen tube within the style so i'll draw myself as well this is the male sex this is the female sex organ called carpal which is structurally having how many parts three parts stigma that is the landing place of pollen grain style the tube that connects the stigma to the ovary which is fruit wall within this fruit wall there is a ovule usually it is inverted and within the ovule there is embryo sac with three antipodals large central cell formed by the fusion of two polar nuclei egg and synergids synergids having filiform apparatus now once the pollen grain they germinate they they pass the compatibility test <sighs> thank you exam please reply exam how sh what should i reply what is your name you are coming with the name exam how will i come to know 
come with a proper name not so that i will i'll tell your name okay so it's for everybody come with proper names that you have why to create a, a false ids okay chalo so stigma so once the pollen grains they land on the stigma what happens once they have to pass some compatibility test once the pollen grains they qualifies the compatibility te test they start producing pollen tube with the help of their intine carrying the male gametes how many two male gametes this pollen tube will grow within the style under the influence of chemicals secreted by the degenerated synergid so once this one of the synergid gets degenerated it start releasing chemicals to attract the pollen tube and pollen tube soon after getting attracted will start moving towards the embryo sac now they will enter inside the embryo sac and will release both the male gametes out of which one of the male gametes fertilizes with the egg to form zygote and second male gamete fertilizes with the secondary cell to form nutritive triploid endosperm together formation of endosperm and zygote is known as double fertilization correct and presence of double fertilization is a characteristic feature of only angiosperms now moving ahead you have seen zygote development now zygote development is done endosperm development is done now you have see you have to see that how zygote develops into embryo so there is some different mechanism in monocot seed monocot zygote and there's some different mechanism of development of embryo from dicot embryo dicot zygote right so please just read it this just see this diagram now here is the zygote a diploid a diploid dicot zygote which first undergoes division to produce two cells the larger suspensor as well as smaller embryonal cell this larger suspensor undergoes number of division to form long cell suspensor and then the lower embryonal cell also divides to form first globular embryo again undergoes further division to form heart shaped embryo further division to form pendant shaped embryo and then finally pendant shaped embryo produces two cotyledons plumule and radical the role of suspensor is to uh, is to absorb nutrition from the endosperm correct just read it once from your ncert important topic and you will understand it better so with this next chapter comes that is genetics part 1 now in genetics part 1 beta the topics which i have selected yes absolutely varman absolutely ha sniga sniga i have for all these chapters i have take i have mainly taken some uh, diagram based question and there's a reason behind it the main reason that why i chose diagram based question is usually and need if i have seen the last 10 year scenario they are focusing more on diagram based questions on their labelings and yes theory also they took they take from diagrams so that is why why not to focus more on diagrams to make our study better and easy right next coming to genetics now in genetics i have taken very less topics why because and majorly i'll say i have taken only those topics which you usually skip and first important section which every student skip and they think that they know is seven pair of mendel hello shrikant is mendel seven pair what the seven contrasting character mendel chose you all just leave this and questions are asked from this section you think that it is very easy and you know you remember but actually when questions are asked you don't remember so that is why i have chosen these seven contrasting characters which mendel chose 
and uh, let's see okay first the seven contrasting characters chose by mendel are seed shape seed color flower color pod shape pod color here only five are mentioned i'll mention the remaining two that is stem height and flower position so these are the seven characters chosen by mendel okay chalo first is seed shape seed shape acha each character has two homozygous pure lines each character is represented by two homozygous pure lines one dominant and another recessive for example seed shape the dominant homozygous pure line is round recessive is wrinkled seed color the dominant homozygous pure line is yellow recessive is green flower color if it is dominant it will be violet if it is recessive it will be white pod shape if it is uh, dominant then it will be inflated full however if it is recessive then it will be constricted talking about pod color it will be green if it is dominant and it will be yellow if it is recessive coming to plant height tall is a dominant pure line and dwarf is the recessive pure line flower position if i talk about dominant trait then it will be axile if i talk about recessive trait then flower position will be terminal so these are the seven characters and 14 pure lines chosen by mendel while working on pea plant for seven consecutive years and by his seven cons uh, during his seven consecutive year work he proposed certain laws like law of dominance law of segregation and law of independent assortment now if i talk about mendel's law of independent assortment then that law says that if two genes they are present on the same chromosome then they segregate i'll be just talking about law of independent assortment mendel said something for law of independent assortment what did he say he said that if on a chromosome if on a chromosome two genes are located maybe near or maybe far away then both the genes during the time of meiosis they will segregate from each other independently if suppose this is t gene this is r gene located located on the same homologous chromosome so according to mendel both the genes located on the chromosome will segregate out each other without blending without influencing that means t will separate from r without influencing each other and then their alleles will also segregate out independent independently without influencing each other so this was law of independent assortment i'll repeat once again according to law of independent assortment proposed by mendel's die hybrid uh, proposed by mendel after working on die hybrid cross was that if two genes are present on the same chromosome whether they may be closely relate closely located or distantly located irrespective of that during the time of meiosis both the genes will segregate out independently and their alleles will also segregate out independently without influencing each other right without influencing each other they all will segregate out independently however when morgan came th morgan he is known as father of modern genetics when th morgan came then he saw something what he saw he saw that mendel's law of independent assortment is wrong if two genes located on same chromosome are very closely present 
then they will not segregate out independently rather they will influence each other and that concept is known as linkage right who is this rajit malik ca chhod ke science padhne laga aapke liye ma'am are wah rajit <laughs> very good chalo so concept of linkage th morgan coined the term linkage th morgan coined the term linkage इन्होंने क्या बोला दैट मेंडल्स लॉ ऑफ इंडिपेंडेंट एजॉर्टमेंट इज नॉट करेक्ट वाई इफ टू जीन्स प्रेजेंट ऑन होमोलोगस क्रोमोजोम इफ टू जीन्स प्रेजेंट ऑन होमोलोगस क्रोमोजोम टू जीन्स प्रेजेंट ऑन होमोलोगस क्रोमोजोम आर क्लोजली प्रेजेंट then they do not segregate out independently then they do not segregate out independently rather they get linked and that concept is known as linkage correct now morgan proved the statement proved his work while working on drosophila so morgan was working on which organism fruit fly scientifically called as drosophila melanogaster he actually considered three genes of drosophila controlled by three different uh, three genes controlling three different characters located on their sex chromosome that is x chromosome so th morgan chose three genes controlling three different characters present on x chromosome those three different characters controlled by three genes considered by morgan are eye color body color and wing size so with the help of these three genes controlling these three different characters mendel uh, sorry morgan performed an experiment and proved that if two genes on the same chromosome they are located very close to each other then they get linked they do not show recombination they do not show crossing over and they then they do not segregate out independently correct so this was all about linkage from my side please go through this page please go uh, read this linkage properly the concept of linkage and recombination meanwhile we'll move ahead with the next topic very important topic questions are asked from this section sex determination in honey bee also known as haplodiplontic sex determination also known as erinotoki right erinotoki and this is also known as haplodiplontic why i have i taken this topic because again this is different topic as well as very very important topic as well chalo so let's see in honey bee beta honey bee mein jo males hote hain they are always haploid right females are always diploid the diploid set of chromosome in honey bee is 32 whereas the haploid number of chromosome in male cells is 16 obviously now female honey bees they produce gametes by the process of meiosis suppose this is a diploid female having 32 chromosome the cell of me or the, the diploid cell of honey bee female honey bee will undergo meiosis to produce gametes having 16 chromosome now if male gametes are produced by the process of mitosis you have to remember this thing male gametes they are produced by mitosis so male gamete is produced now if male gamete and female gamete they fuses then they always result in a female offspring that is n is equal to 32 but if female gamete directly develop into 
if the female gamete directly undergo parthenogenesis without fertilization then it develops into male honey bee which is known as drone so males in case of honey bee they developed without fertilization hence they are haploid in nature and females they are always developed after fertilization so they are diploid in nature correct okay ishant okay fine ha ha arush i am listening to him hmm use red color while marking it won't be visible to you johnny aapka swagat nahi karenge bilkul karenge bhai why not you have arrived so early when i am just about to end my session so you have arrived bilkul i'll do your swagat <laughs> don't worry i am having that i am like a, a mother of karan johar's movie uh, holding the the big thal with the diya and i'm just waiting for you you come running down from the helicopter like uh, like who like akshay kumar no sorry shahrukh khan surely i'll do that chalo okay moving ahead with the next chapter ha ah, now we have some pedigree charts to solve the one pedigree chart which i'm going to solve right now is uh, okay so now the pedigree chart which i am going to solve in front of you is of autosomal recessive i'll teach you yes udit very good ha ah, ayush this fellow is making me jaya bachchan only He is saying that swagat nahi karoge hamara. So I said no. You come running down through the helicopter. I am having that arti ka thal, and then I'll take out. I'll take. I'll take your arti. I'll surely. I'll do this. Chalo, stop doing nonsense. Need time, eh, beta? It's your need time. and now stop doing all those nonsense in the chat box chalo okay so now let's try to understand how to solve these pedigree charts now the most thank you varman thank you okay if i talk about autosomal see some pedigree charts that you should know हा यस यस आयुष कम ऑन सो योर पेडिग्री चार्ट सबसे पहले आई शो यू हाउ टू सॉल्व योर पेडिग्री चार्ट आई एल कंसिडर वन एज माई ऑटोजोमल रेसेसिव सपोज इफ आई एम सॉल्विंग द चार्ट फॉर अ ट्रेट विच इज ऑटोजोमल रेसेसिव देन हाउ विल आई कम टू नो दैट इट इज ऑटोजोमल रेसेसिव नाउ सी if i talk about my pedigree diseases then they are usually of two types one is autosomal and second are sex linked right some disorders related to pedigree are autosomal and some are sex linked in autosomal diseases can be of two type autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive coming to sex linked again there can be two types x linked or y linked if i talk about x linked then again there can be two types either x linked dominant or x linked recessive right bachcho now i'm going to tell you the basic mantra so that you can solve all the types of pedigree if they come if a chart is of autosomal dominant trait then those offsprings who or those organisms who are diseased hi bhumika if those organisms who are diseased their genotype will be either homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant 
and those offsprings who are normal their genotype will be homozygous recessive if the trait is autosomal dominant coming to autosomal recessive just the reverse organisms who are diseased their genotype will be homozygous recessive and those organisms who are normal their genotype will be either homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant correct now x linked me dekho if the disorder is x linked if the disorder is x linked dominant then what will happen then in that case the genotype for female this will be also diseased and this will also be wait wait oh uh, where is my razor this was normal and this will also be diseased in males no condition diseased if it is x linked recessive then this condition in female will be carrier this condition in male male have no options for x linked diseased and this condition in females for x linked recessive will be diseased right yeah carrier female ma'am please remove okay need delayed arush stop it don't spread uh, uh, fake news in the class these students they are just waiting for need to these students they are just waiting for need to get postponed them false hopes they will all uh, uh, run away so please arush and nobody else please don't give them false hopes hai na so this see i have told you the genotype if you now know the genotype then surely you can solve the you can guess the trait how let's try if it is autosomal recessive then all those offsprings whom you see normal just mention their genotype normal genotype normal normal oh uh, sorry yeah though in if it is autosomal recessive then all those who are normal either there will be homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant and all those who are being shown as diseased their genotype will be homozygous recessive so red ones their genotype is clear homozygous recessive now let's see about those whose genotype is not yet clear either they will be homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant now just make the cross and try to solve then you will come to know and if that this chart is actually homozygous recessive now i have told you just make a cross in between the parents and check their probability that which offspring can be normal or which offspring offspring can be diseased hi sumit how are you so just by doing this check the probabilities in their offspring but this is the main thing this chart is important if you know how to analyze the genotype of diseased and non diseased for every chart then solving pedigree becomes really very easy try by this method hope you get your answers okay moving ahead with the next important topic that is molecular next chapter molecular basis of inheritance hi swad how are you in molecular basis of inheritance first topic which i have taken is the structure of dna itself if i talk about structure of yeah. okay so if i talk about structure of dna the dna structure was proposed actually by watson and crick by using the concepts of shargaff morris wilkins and rosalind franklin so the nobel prize who got uh, the people who got nobel prize for discovering the structure of dna for decoding the structure of dna were watson and crick they said that dna is a double stranded structure both the strands of dna they run anti parallel that means if the polarity from one is one strand is 5 prime to 3 prime then another strand polarity will be 3 prime to 5 prime okay 
then according to watson and crick the double stranded structure of dna is stabilized by hydrogen bonds that establishes between the nitrogenous bases now these are nitrogenous bases they are held together with the help of hydrogen bonds three nit three hydrogen bonds are present between gc and two hydrogen bonds are present between at so there are four nitrogenous bases that makes up the structure of dna adenine that pairs with thymine guanine that pairs with cytosine always nitrogenous bases are going to project inward and the backbone of dna is made up of sugar phosphate yeah 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 swad i got it my all love to all the people of andhra pradesh out there yeah sure sumit i'll come to uttarakhand hopefully soon chalo now let's talk about so i was telling you that the structure of dna was decoded by watson and crick structurally dna is a polymer of nucleotides to make one nucleotide three components are required that is uh, five carbon pentose sugar ribose sugar nitrogenous base which can be either adenine thymine guanine or cytosine and phosphate group right so please just revise the structure of dna properly i'll move ahead with the next important structure that is nucleosome now if i talk about nucleosome students the nucleosome represents the basic level of packaging in eukaryotes it represents the basic level of packaging in case of eukaryotes and it is done with the help of positively charged proteins called histones histones they are made up of two main amino acids yeah they are made up of two amino acids lysine and arginine so these histones are made up these are positively charged proteins made up of two amino acids lysine and arginine histones are usually found in eukaryotic dna only they are absent in prokaryotes except archaebacteria chalo now what happens in eukaryotes the basic level of packaging how histone helps in formation of these ball like structures nucleosome so there are four types of histones h2a h2b h3 and h4 h2a h2b h3 and h4 now in sub key two two copies the two two copies of each histone which i have mentioned they join together to form a ball like structure called histone octamer that is h2a h2b h3 h3 h4 h4 h2b and h2a right so histone octamer is produced by the four different histones which are present in double the copy double copies now this is a positively charged ball histone octamer around which kareeb 200 base pairs they wrap around near about 200 base pairs of dna they wrap around this histone positively charged histone why they are wrapping because dna are negatively charged and octamer is positively charged so simply they wrap around this and now this wrapping is then logged by h1 histone protein so just so that this dna does not unwrap again so h1 histone protein blocks this entire structure and this is known as nucleosome number of nucleosomes then they are joined with the help of linker dna these nucleosomes when you observe on the microscope then these nucleosome gives you a bead like structure beads on string like structure when you observe the chromatin fiber under microscope within a nucleus of a cell correct so this is your nucleosome also known as nu body and this is made up of histone octamer plus 200 base pairs of dna correct okay yes dekh lo bhai we are so dedicated but but we want same dedication from your side as well 
okay wait let me yes next is next topic which you have to do is meselson and stahl experiment in meselson and stahl experiment these are the two people who explained that dna replicates nahi nahi rajiv i'm not on fasting no i'm just fasting because of you all only and i really want dedication from your all side chalo so this experiment meselson and stahl experiment was proposed by uh, sorry meselson and stahl experiment tells us that dna replicates semi conservatively the main aim of this experiment by meselson and stahl is to show that dna replicates semi conservatively इन्होंने क्या यूज किया था वॉट डू मीन बाय सेमी कंजर्वेटिव सो एक्चुअली दीज टू पीपल वाइल वर्किंग ऑन इकोलाय वाइल वर्किंग ऑन इकोलाय मीजलसन एंड स्टाल एक्सप्लेन दैट बोथ द स्ट्रांड ऑफ डीएनए फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल अंडर गोज रेप्लीकेशन टू प्रोड्यूस न्यू डॉटर डीएनए स्ट्रांड एंड द न्यू डॉटर स्ट्रांड विच आर प्रोड्यूस्ड there one of the strand is parental and the another complementary strand which is produced is new so 50% is conserved and 50% is new during dna replication hello ashok how are you so you can say that dna replicates semi conservatively 50% is conserved and 50% is newly synthesized this was proved by measles and Sta measles and stall while working on e coli they cultured e coli in two different mediums of ammonium chloride one which was made up of heavy isotope of nitrogen and another which was made up of light isotope of nitrogen so he tried to culture e coli in two different mediums and then he proved that dna replicates semi conservatively hope you know this experiment well moving ahead with the next structure of trna ah thank you sumit i know sayyad you have joined right now no sayyad we are not doing the questions we are just revising some concepts hmm chalo let's see the structure of trna there are two structures of trna proposed one is two dimensional and another is three dimensional the man the one which is there in your syllabus is a two dimensional structure that you see on your screen the two dimensional structure of trna was proposed by i think it was yeah it was proposed by holy and it resembles a clover leaf life clover leaf like having arms and loops so structure of trna consists of how many arms 1 2 3 4 how many loops 1 2 3 4 this is the first arm second arm third arm fourth arm and this is known as variable loop right the main role of trna why it is known as adapter rna is because this trna is going to join the specific amino acid to the specific codon on the mrna with the help of its first arm and the third arm first arm is known as amino acid binding arm it is amino acid binding arm where specific amino acid binds correct and which amino acid has to bind how will it guide now suppose on the codon on the mrna codon is uac this uac codon specifically codes for amino acid tyrosine 
अनएम्बिग्विटी इज देयर वन कोडोन विल ऑलवेज कोड फॉर वन अमीनो एसिड सो यू ए सी कोडोन इव इज देयर ऑन द एम आर एन ए विच इज रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर कोडिंग टाइरोसीन सो वेन एवर कोडोन यू ए सी विल कम स्पेसिफिक टी आर एन ए कैरिंग टाइरोसिन विल कम एंड विल गेट अटैच टू द कोडोन सपोज द कोडोन इज ए जी यू ए जी यू कोडोन कोड फॉर सेरीन सो द टी आर एन ए विच इज गोइंग टू बाइंड विद द कोडोन ए जी यू विल ब्रिंग सेरीन अमीनो एसिड बिकॉज ए जी यू कोडोन बाइंड ऑलवेज विद सेरीन सो दिस इज द एंटी दिस इज एंटी कोडोन बाइंडिंग आर्म दैट बाइंड विद स्पेसिफिक कोडोन विद द हेल्प ऑफ इट्स एंटी कोडोन्स and the code whatever codon is there accordingly the amino acid will be attached and this trna therefore is known as adapter rna because it joins the two because it joins amino acid to the mrna ayush ambiguous means not matlab when there is a confusion an ambiguity simply means that specific you can say that codons are very much specific if it is aug codon it is always going to code for methionine aisa nahi hoga that if aug if aug is there then aug can also code for tyrosine no there is no confusion there is specificity there is clarity that this codon will always code with for this specific amino acid this is an ambiguity no confusion clear cut specific okay chalo now let's move ahead now we are going to okay now we are moving ahead with the next topic that is strategies so please i learn the structure of uh, uh, trna as well now we are moving ahead with the next chapter strategies in strategies the only important thing which i have taken is steps of plant breeding see strategy jo chapter hai bachcho that is divided into two that is half of the part you study in botany and half of the part you study in zoology so here i am only going to take the zool sorry botany part and in botany part if i talk about the important topic the understanding topic is simply steps of plant breeding if i have to talk about the steps of plant breeding then the that is steps of hybridization the very first step is collection of germ plasm very important step the most important step is the first step in plant breeding collection of germ plasm germ plasm means collection of all the diverse genes of all and their alleles of different species and variety in one right to sabse pehla step hota hai germ plasm collect karna collection of all the diverse alleles of all the genes found in different species and their varieties once the germ plasm is being collected second step is selection of the parent from the germ plasm whosoever desired qualities you want to mix in the hybrid accordingly you choose your parent from the germ plasm after selecting the parents third is performing cross pollination out of the two parent you selected one can be considered as male another can be considered as female now desired pollen grains has to be dusted on the desired stigma right so third step is performing cross pollination okay so next step is third step is cross pollination that is dusting of desired pollen grain on the desired stigma once this step is done this is the most tedious and the most uh, what to say time consuming step once it is done then you have to obtain your hybrids the hybrid seeds now all the seeds which are obtained may not be hybrid some seeds may not be carrying the good properties of both the parent some seeds may carry so next step is selection of the recombinant seeds the seeds which you actually want so next step after cross pollination will be selection of 
hybrid seeds the seeds which have both the good qualities of the parent once you have done that then you have to test that whether you have selected the seeds correctly or not the next step is testing once your seeds passes testing then you can release them in the market and sell them as new hybrid varieties so these are the steps of plant breeding collection of germ plasm selection of the parent cross pollination selection of recombinant seeds testing them for some generation and then when you finally get satisfied you can release them in the market as the new hybrid variety same steps were done by dr norman burlog and then he brought green revolution in the whole world and the same concept was brought to india by dr m s swami nathan he introduced some semi dwarf varieties of wheat and rice in india that led to increase in their production tremendously and brought green revolution in our country as well you can read all those topics from your ncert just to ensure that you know them well so far we'll move ahead towards the last chapter that i'm going to discuss today see i'm not discussing ecology i'll only take till microbes in human welfare the only reason is that from ecology onwards the last four chapter you only have to do it from ncert so i will not take your much time in discussing all those chapters i have only taken those chapters which apart from ncert some extra information also you should know so i have only taken those chapters not taken ecology for today's discussion only the reason is you can stick to ncert in that so last chapter which i am going to discuss today yes varman from my side will be microbes in human welfare for this the first thing which i am going to tell you about is the three bioactive molecules ha ah, yes the three ha ah, yes sumit fir main chali jaungi varman now your josh is at peak right when ma'am is leaving then your josh is at peak ha ah? bioactive molecules so bioactive molecules there are three which you have to remember cyclosporin a okay second is streptokinase and third are statins cyclosporin a which is obtained from tri trichoderma is acting as immunosuppressive agent then streptokinase which is obtained from bacteria streptococcus acts as a clot buster to those patients who have undergone myocardial infarction and statins they are obtained from fungi monascus purpureus which helps to lower the cholesterol blood cholesterol level yes very good varman please remember them cyclosporin a clot buster streptokinase it helps uh, to uh, ha huh. it is given to patients who have uh, oh god cyclosporin a helps uh, to it, it acts as a immunosuppressive agent correct ah uh, okay sumit yeah very good mona yes correct so these are the three bioactive molecules i can see ayush ma'am aapko leave karke jane ka man nahi kar raha acha ayush okay 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 very good very good so there are three bioactive molecules which you have to yeah very good varman so cyclosporin a is given to those patients who have undergone organ transplantation streptokinase is given to those patients who have undergone myocardial infarction and statins are given to those patients who want to lower their blood cholesterol level so please remember them match the following this year question is there in the paper so please remember from which organisms are these chemicals obtained and what are their functions moving ahead with the last topic of today's session hints on sewage treatment plant now you know that gallons of water in the form of sewage is produced every day is that water getting wasted no 
द वॉटर विच यू फ्लश आउट गोज इन दीज बिग बिग सी विच ट्रीटमेंट प्लांट फॉर प्यूरिफिकेशन एंड वंस दे गेट प्यूरिफाइड देन दे अगेन कम बैक टू योर हो so whatever you are flushing again you are receiving the same water but once it gets treated and those huge plants where sewage is being treated is known as sewage treatment plant the sewage treatment plant in sewage treatment plant rather the purification is done in three levels first is physical treatment right second is or primary treatment where only sedimentation and filtration is practiced simply physical removal of insoluble dirts in the sewage in the water second is biological also called as secondary treatment right where use of living organisms microbes both aerobic and anaerobic is done to clean the water these bacteria these aerobic and anaerobic bacteria they are used to remove the dissolved organic waste in the sewage right and the third step is tertiary or chemical tertiary or chemical step these two this in the last step the water is finally treated with chemicals like ozone or chlorine and once the step is done then the water is ready to be discharged in the river bodies water remem remember bachcho water should not be directly discharged in the water bodies otherwise it is going to damage your river bodies right like ganga and yamuna so but if you really want to discharge your waste in the river bodies then first they should be treated in this manner physical treatment biological treatment chemical uh, chemical treatment in physical only sedimentation filtration in biological use of microbes is done both aerobic and anaerobic and in chemical use of chemicals like ozone and chlorine is done once all these steps are done you can directly dump in the water body for further usage so please read it from ncert i will suggest you and with this we have finally come to the end of our whole discussion and thank you so much for being such good listeners and bearing with me and yes of course in the last i would like to say all the very very best please students give your best and once you give your best surely you receive the best so thank you for joining me and yes bye bye everyone take care ya mat jao bhai jana padega chalo bye everyone take care see you all